operators. So I'm Tianning. I'm computer scientist at Adobe. I've been Adobe working for three years. Um, and just a little, some fun fact about me is that uh, I'm also a co-host uh, for a podcast, uh, Silicon Valley 1001. And the podcast is about international students in the US, what the challenge we'll face, um, and like the story, how we overcome the obstacles. So if you're interested, you could check it out um, at all podcast platforms. And just as I asked before, it's also my first time attending U.S. Recording Taiwan High in Tech Forum. So I'm very excited to uh, learn this uh, exciting topics with all of you um, um, fellow attendees. Yeah. And now I will turn it to the other moderator, Mingyan. Hi, everyone. I'm Mingyan. And uh, this is also my first time uh, attending this event. And a little bit about myself. I received my just received my PhD from UC Berkeley, and right now I'm working at NVIDIA as a hardware engineer. And, and I also serve as a co-host for the Silicon Valley 101 podcast, as Tianlin introduced. And I will also organize another event next year, uh, TEDx Woodside. Yeah. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay, so a little bit about our uh, co-organizer, Digitime. Uh, Digitime was established in 1998 as a leading professional media platform in greater China to report on the global supply chain of the technology industry. And they also provide some uh, research material. Uh, Digitime research provide research data, production and sales data, and professional analysis across upstream, midstream, downstream, and end market. And, and Digitime also has a very close connection with Natias. And there's, there's a few of their staff is here. And if, every, if anyone interested in uh, contacting them, please feel free to leave a comment in the chat box and interact with them. Okay, next slide, please. And also another co-organizer, the uh, Digitime Asia. Uh, Digitime Asia uh, has been launched in uh, May 2021, and it's more focused on Asia's technology industry to a key strate strategic position in the world, providing Asia application and ICT news and views, and promoting the continued growth of related industry worldwide. And please follow them uh, through the QR code on the bot button right, and you will find their website. And also uh, to emphasize again, their staff is here. If you are interested in, please feel free to reach out to them. Okay, next slide, please. And our co-host, the NSTC, stands for National Science and Technology Council. They have a uh, four mission uh, to promote the national development of science and technology, to support academic research, to provide government of science parks, to foster in innovative initiatives. And they also have three elements, essential elements. First, to facilitate advancing research in science and technology to make connection between fundamental research and apply innovation in private sector, to coordinate and integrate inter interdepartmental, interdepartmental policy in science and technology. And also, uh, please feel free to look up more information on, through their website. Okay, next slide, please. And our community partners, InnoVax, TSIA stands for uh, Taiwan Semiconductor Industry Association and IEEE Young Professional. And once again, the TEDx website, uh, Tianning will also serve as a moderator in that event. And that will happen next year, January 28th at Stanford University campus. And please feel free to follow them on LinkedIn or Instagram. Next slide, please. Okay, so please join me to welcome Jen Min, 
uh, Vice President of Natia Silicon Valley 2022 to give us a brief introduction of the conference and Natia. And Jamin, now it's your time. All right. Thank you, Mingyan and Tianning, uh, for the uh, warm introduction. Uh, good, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to where you are. This is Chemin Lao from uh, Natia uh, Silicon Valley. On behalf of our organization and uh, the program committee of the event, I would like to welcome you to the first day of 2022 U.S. Taiwan High Tech Forum. Our organization uh, has hosted the event uh, since 1998. And we have fortune uh, to continue uh, this end endeavor of having the 25th uh, US Taiwan uh, US Taiwan High Tech Forum uh, to cross up uh, to uh, overcome uh, the uh, post pandemic barrier. And this is the event that we are hosting online a third time in a row. This is for, uh, therefore, we want to uh, give you a, a good experience across barrier uh, experience about course different time zone, course different region or of kind of experience. I would also like to uh, introduce our nonprofit organization is Nadia. It stands for North American Taiwanese Engineering Science Association, which was found 1991 at Silicon Valley by a group of engineers and scientists. Uh, we are glad um, after 30 years uh, later today, the mission are carried over and we continue to develop uh, the platform of playground for commu uh, communities to learn new trends, to expand our network for professional growth. There are several examples uh, like this uh, annual flagship event, the uh, US High Tech Forum uh, today and next Friday. We also host other uh, professional events like working group events and seminars like Women Summit uh, generally on March of each, uh, every year, as well as some uh, mid-scale or small-scale events like the working group seminar for program manager and the uh, entrepreneurship. If you are interested in learning more about us, more about Natia, uh, please uh, stop by and uh, visit uh, www.natia.org. Okay, on behalf of the uh, US Taiwan uh, High Tech Forum, I believe most of you will have uh, enjoyed uh, the excellent talk from our industry leaders in today's event. Again, uh, I appreciate, we appreciate your time uh, standing with us today and believe the program today will be informative and enjoyable uh, toward the semiconductor, EV, and supply chain domains. All right, with that, I would like to turn my podium back to Mingyan and Tanyan. Thank you very much and enjoy. Thank you so much for Jamie for the uh, detailed introduction for both the forum and the uh, uh, Natia organization. So for me personally, I heard that Natia also organized event for women in tech um, and that uh, happened around the time as like in March. So I'm very excited for that event. So if you don't want to miss out for all the uh, inspiring events that Natia host, uh, please follow us in this two um, channels. One is the Facebook group and the other is the LinkedIn page. So as I saw from uh, Jing Chen's comment in the Q&A box, uh, Jing Chen said uh, he learned this event from Facebook. So definitely more event will be coming on those two groups. So I kind of like posing this slide for a minute um, just to let everyone to scan the code and to join the group. And hopefully uh, we can stay all connected with all the exciting events. Okay, so now let's get to the next page. That's um, download the program book for this uh, US Taiwan High Tech Foreign Event 2022. And so just like some small intro, uh, kind of like, I, I, I bet like everyone uh, uh, can find it. So if you just like go to the www.uthf.net um, our website, 
and just scroll down, you will see a section that has the program and there's a, a text say 2022 program book. So just click on that button and then you should see one PDF popping up and that's the program book. And then you can find every uh, topic abstract and all the introduction of the speaker from a program book. Um, can have all the information you will need for this event. Okay, and then let's get to the next page to talk a little bit about how to ask questions to speakers on Zoom. And again, um, like we mentioned earlier, very uh, apologies that we have some technical issue with the chat box here. So um, let's interact with the Q&A chat box. Um, we will have a staff like monitor everyone's response and everyone's comments there and to uh, get back to you if you have any questions. Um, so, also, like when we have the speak for speaker today, and when speaker uh, finish their, their topic, we all have five minutes allocated for the Q and A. So, what we want to do is that uh, if you can have your question early, so our staff in the background they can uh, first organize the questions and then um, put them in. Uh, them in the order of like what questions we're going to ask to speaker to save some time. So we will recommend um, because like for each speaker we'll have 35 minutes and the last five minutes we allocate for Q&A. So if you can put your put down your question at least five minutes before the talk ends, then we can um, make sure we have more time to uh, add your question in a queue as well. And yeah. That's, uh, I think that's everything I want to cover. Um, so then I will turn that to the other moderator, Mingyan, to introduce our first speaker. Yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, thanks for the good, very good timing, Tianyin. Uh, we are on the, our right track, 45. And it's now time to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Jia Hongjian uh, is an Intel Senior Fellow and IEEE Fellow. He earned a Master Degree and PhD Degree in Material Science from University of Wisconsin-Madison. Dr. Jian holds more than 120 more U.S. patents. Please join us to welcome Dr. Jian. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction, Jamie. Okay, uh, give me 30 seconds, allow me 30 seconds to introduce myself. Uh, as I say, I'm Zhao Hongjian. I work for Intel for 32 years. I joined Intel staff from the point A micron technology through the years from point A, point six, point three five, point two five, point one A, point one three. And then 1965, 45, 32, 22, 14, and seven. Many, many generations. Uh, I, I start with the process engineers, and later I become the integration engineer. In the last 15 years, I was a program manager for Intel 65, 45, 32, 22, 14, and seven system on chip technology. Okay. Uh, I'm, I over the years, I learned a, quite a lot from Moore's Law. So today I'm very glad to share my learning experience with Moore's Law with everybody here. So the title of my presentation in, is In Moore's Law We Trust, We Believe in Moore's Law. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, although when talk about uh, the, the Armstrong era and how Moss law can, uh, can uh, uh, benefit industry for the uh, Armstrong era. But I will start from the beginning of the Moss law, which is 65 years ago. Okay. So uh, I'm start, this is my opening page. Okay. I show here the, the lab access is performance for what, and the access is the time. Here show you the Intel 19 nanometer all the way to uh, uh, Intel 3 and the uh, Intel 28. 28, when starting from 28, people start calling this the Armstrong era. 
We are not yet there yet. In next few years, we will be there. Yeah. So the main question arises, hey, is most law ready to embrace this big change from, uh, from micro, narrow, and to Amazon era? Okay, so this is the, the, the outlook, this outline of my talk. I will start with talk about history and speed rates of Moss Law. And second part, we talk about some technical challenges of Moss Law as of today. And so I want to give you the outlook of Moss Law for the next 10 years. Okay, I start with the history and spirit of Moss Law. All right, this is the uh, part of the Moss Law history. So 1965, 1965 is the beginning of Moss Law. Goldemore observed and predicted that the number of transistors incorporated in a chip will possibly double every 24 years. Right. This is his observation, and he made the very bold projection of this will continue. Right. Uh, but he did not say how. <laughs> he did not say how. Okay. So uh, the how comes from the second page. 10 years later, Robert Dinard, which is an IBM fellow, and, and he was credited to invent uh, the theorem. He came up the model. He said, if this is a very simple, what I show here is a very, very simple MOS transistor uh, 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 procession. And he said, if you scale every dimension by 0.7, you will get, in two years, you will get pretty much get a 0.5x reduction of the areas, or you can say 2x increase of the, the density. And you will, you will achieve that while project by order more. But more than that, I think that's also very important. Say, he also say with doing this way, you can get not only density, you can the speed and power efficiency improvement at the same time. This is very important because if most of just by the density, then you probably will not last for that long until now. Because it has a motivation for speed and power efficiency. Hey, a lot, a lot of IT uh, uh, product jump into that. They not only want to get the cost benefit, they also want to get the performance and the power benefit, right? And the third pioneer in the, in the IC manufacturing is famous. Okay, this, this pioneer was, was uh, less mentioned in the history of the IC making, right? Famous is the one of the uh, uh, Nobel uh, uh, laureate in physics, right? He suggests that you would do in 1985, 10 years after the I said, hey, you would do the uh, three dimensional, you could get, uh, you could achieve the same goal with, uh, and with the same uh, area scaling uh, uh, improvement instead of using a two dimensional and push everything hard, right? 1985, people had not thought about this, okay. So, but his, this vision is very important to help other people to, to, uh, to, to establish the fundamental back then. All right, so with all these uh, uh, earlier pioneers' visions, and the industry put together a very strong CPU uh, 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 product come out start from 1970. What I show here is Intel, but I think other people from uh, other semiconductor company also will have similar trend, right? What left hand side shows the transistor product and the access is the year of mass production. You can see pretty much some for Intel 404, which created the first uh, microprocessor in the world. Every, uh, every two years, the transistor supply almost increased to 2x, and also people enjoy the performance and power improvement. Now in CPU, now in CPU, what I show here is most of all everywhere. Here is the same product as the previous product showing the microprocessor, uh, uh, 2x per two years density. We can observe, observe this trend in the DRAM, which is almost uh, in parallel with the microprocessor. Or you could even look the the the, the flash technology. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, Flex is running even higher than the two x, closer to three x in the most recent trend. Then I you look at the 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 hard drive, 
right? People have hard drive, different uh, 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 shape of the hard drive. Uh, you are as old as I am, I use a very thick, just like a brick. But nowadays people use a very, very thin hard drive. And it followed the two expert, uh, two SNT for two years uh, uh, projection. And even you go further beyond the, what we say the computer, right? Go to the flat panel display. You can see in the last 20 years, it followed the most law. If only the SDTV to EDTV to 4HD and with 4K, 8K, it followed the most law. My, my personal favorite is this one, this image sensor, because I, I like to do uh, photography, right? It is not 2X. Image sensor is not 2X, but also you can see it still has very strong, very strong exponential factors, right? I see the, uh, this forum will talk about the EV, digital vehicles, right? Actually, I, I've been tracking the, the battery status of the electrical vehicle, right? It is, it is very flat early on, but in the recent 10 years after Tesla introduced their model, uh, and, and they are coming uh, uh, about two to three X in the last 10 years. However, it's maybe too early to call because I, I you know, we need to see the how uh, industry uh, uh, fair with the, the, the battery is not the electron and the hose transition. Right, battery is the ions there, there's an ion there. If it, I, my projection, it will not follow 2x, but you will have certain throw for exponential. Okay, so this is good. Uh, now I look, want to look the timeline of Moss Law. I would talk about the early pioneers of Moss Law and people build the, the good IT products, but then that, that one switch a little bit a direction to talk about the, uh, uh, what people, the common about Moss Law. Here is the timeline from the 1960 to nowadays, 60 years, right? And the starting from the 1965, go to more this uh, Moss Law, announced the Moss Law and the industry making steady progress on Moss Law. And uh, in the entering the year 2000, has more invention to support the extension of Moss Law. I'll talk more about that later, right? But on the flip side, on the free side, we see a lot of negative, negative or pessimistic uh, comment about Moscow. Year 2000, MIT Techno Review say, hey, uh, Moscow is the end. Moscow is the end. And later, PC World say, hey, you know, Moscow is on the horizon in 2010. Solid state technology say, hey, Moscow has stopped at 28 nanometer. And then the technology review in the 2016, as go one more time, most law is there, and now what? Uh, please notice these two MIT technology review are from different authors. But they were, they were very pessimistic of most law. And we'll look at the recent, recent comment of the most law that were even more interesting. Uh, in Taiwan, since we're talking about, about Taiwan, and Taiwan uh, uh, most, Kijibu, they say, hey, they found a new way to break through the uh, 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 chip design and uh, to extend the most law. Mark Du, TSMC uh, 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 chair, right? he's a chairperson, right? Right, he in the 2021 IC, ISSCC keynote, he said, hey, he is confident industry can maintain two X or two years historical trend of most law. But recently, just two weeks two weeks ago, we, we heard that Jensen Huang say, wow, he thinks Mosul is dead. Of course, um, there's other CEO of the position, he say, hey, no, we looked Mosul still alive and well, right? Okay, now, so it's, it's a many positive and pessimistic remarks with Mosul. People will be confused, why is that? Why is that? People can use that, use the Mosul to build a lot of good products, but why sometimes people have looked at it and say, hey, it may not extend to, to uh, uh, next 10 years. I like to use a comment, which I showed right now. In the 2003, Gordon Moore in ISCC talk, he said, no exponential is forever. Your job is the, the attendees 
and to that conference, about 3,000 people is to delaying forever. And I, I can say, I can tell that after 20 years, most of us are still going. <laughs> so I think that everybody doing a good job. Everybody in IT industry doing a good job to delay the most law because it will bring the, the cost benefit, performance benefit, and the power benefit. Okay. But I want to explain why people have the different opinion of, of the most law. Before go that, I go to spirit of Moore's law. Moore's law is not a law of physics. So when people look at the angle of law of physics, they say, hey, Moore's law will end very soon, right? But it's not a law of physics. And uh, Moore's law also is not just a law of economy. People have sometimes say, hey, Moore's law actually is a law of economy. This is for early Gautamol, uh, a comment about the uh, uh, 2x improvement every two years, which can reduce the cost quite a lot. That's why it has the economy uh, a common attached to the Moore's law. I like more of it will combine Moore's law and the Denas model. It will close to a lot of efficiency, give you performance power and area benefit every two years. And uh, PPA, is, if people work in semiconductor industry, you know it's called PPA, performance power area, I think. Is a good description of the spirit of Moore's law. But not only this, it is very important of the execution of Moore's law. So the success of the extension of the Moore's law has been propelled by the timely integration, which I, 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 I golden colored, of te key technology elements, a device, lithography, math materials, and the packaging. You could have good ideas, but if uh, uh, you cannot execute the integration of this idea, you will be late, you will be late, then you will not follow the Moore's law. And other people can do that, you will do that. So, talk about, I actually go to the point there. Uh, they're not mentioned everything time 0 0.7, 0 0.7, right? but we have a lot of weapons. Same kind of the engineers, manufacturing engineer has a lot of weapons here, can actually alter that. I use the next photo to, to explain that. Okay, so I want to start talking about these four areas. Device, lithography, materials, and the packaging, right? Stuff with the uh, 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 device, right? So this graph showing the one of the key metrics for semiconductor, right? The left axis is uh, minimum gain length. You can from 0.01 micron to up to 10 micron. Right, uh, right, uh, y axis is a uh, little T ox, and the axis is a technology no timeline. You can see in the first 30 years, uh, uh of most law, people actually following what they now project using 0.7x for each dimension to, to get a very, very good results. Very good result, but this model stopped at 0.13 micron. After 90 millimeter, this will not work. And that's why MIT make a comment say, hey, most of us dead. Why is that? Because what is the one important factor is the electrode TOX. We already reached one nanometer, 10 amson at year 2000. With, with that thin oxide, the huge gate will generate in tunnels through that. So that's the MIT, yes, they're, 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 they're physics. They say, hey, this will not work, right? So what do we do? What do we do, right? And uh, I, I, I personally involved with the development in this section, so I'm very attached to explain what industry has done to overcome this problem. We're not sitting idle. We're not sitting idle. At the 19 nanometer, you can see the, the green line flattened out because electrical TLs cannot be for the scale. But people come out with a new idea, you use the strain silicon, strain silicon to improve like PMOS, the strength can keep with 30% of performance improvement, mobility improvement, which, which was not even in the textbook. Actually, today is a textbook <laughs> still showing that uh, PMOS mobility is a 450, MOS is a 1400, but actually with the strength silicon techniques, uh, this number can be broken. The mobility PMOS is much higher than uh, 450, and MOS actually for 1400. Back then, right? So people use innovation, study in 
in 2009, people use innovation to overcome the problem of physical limit. So if we stick with the law of physics, most of it will not last for over 30 years. Now, four years later, four years later, at 45 nanometer, an industry had come out a solution for high K metal gate, which is, uh, can mitigate the gate leakage by increasing the physical thickness of the gate diatrix by introducing the high K materials. What I show in the right hand side is some, some uh, uh, classic picture of people are showing the benefit of this technology. Right? And uh, four years later, people use a come out of film fan. It's the first time people use uh, the three D transistor to further improve uh, performance and power, and but throw down the dimension of the the uh, diuretic and the gate length. Right. So so it's it's, a, it's a very flexible. It's a very very flexible. If people start with the the the, the most law itself. It will not go. But people, creative engineers, are creative, come a different solution to overcome that. In the next page, I, I want to explain these three very, very innovative idea between 2000 and, uh, and even now, right? First is string silicon. Is you look at the, the 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 upper one is the equation on the IT set. The string silicon actually improve the mobility. Mobility is, could be 15, 30 percent. Then the high K metal gate to make your gate address even thinner. Now you, you can you can thin down the deck to, to get the more dry current. And the, the current status is using the, the tri gate or now called FinFan, which gives you the much better short channel control of VT. Now you can load the VT and load the dry current, well, load the voltage and get a, a performance improvement there. All right, that was history. That was history. Today is, I said, we are on the FinFan. Now the question is, okay, what about next 10 years? What about 10, next 10 years, right? So uh, actually there's a very, very good progress to define the architecture of the device. Well, we, people are working on so-called ribbon fat, narrow shift or GAA, get all wrong. That was well, fully enclosed. Uh, we fully enclosed the, the, the channel by the uh, gate diagnostic and the wall function metal. If you look at the, the, the lower side, you can get a better children control and why you scale the, the gate length. And uh, the next one is called CFAT, complementary uh, uh, fat, which is stack N and P together, right? You reduce the area. If, imagine that from, from river fat to CFAT, you actually get the 2X dimension, a uh, 2X density, right? And uh, with this 2x density, actually, you don't need to stretch the load, uh, the, the x the device gating uh, dimension too fast. And ultimately, the device is 2D fat. Yeah, two, using 2D material, 2D material gives the performance improvement, right? Because at that, that time, the channel is very, very short now. Right? Okay, so I, my projection is next 10 years. People were busy with these ideas, and also uh, through the through the first twenty years, through the twenty years of the uh, after nineteen ninety, like people look at different uh, uh, transistor architectures, right? And people sometimes, you know, there are many many structures being being brought up. But I, I actually, as a as a engineer working on this field, I feel very very happy. Now, since people settle down these transistor architecture and those are durable, they're durable. Imagine this 3D transistor architecture is using by, by today used by the NAND technology. NAND is in built 200 layers. Here I show you only six layers. NAND use 200 layers, this, this uh, uh, nano shift structure to, to, to use today the, the, the 3D NAND, right? So I feel very comfortable, I think, People will be busy in the next 10 years by, by implementing this idea. Okay, next one I want to talk about very critical uh, uh, parameter, a technical parameter to extend the most law, which is photolithography. It's the four year stuff for this on so called Rayleigh criteria, Rayleigh criteria. Really, criteria. Really, really criteria describe this for physics stuff. Like, hey, your resolution of photolithography is a function right here. D is the resolution, and lambda is the 
the optical wavelengths. And there are two other factors, K1 and the NA numerical aperture. Numerical aperture, you use a larger lens, you can get a better resolution. You divide the lens is a number larger, D with smaller, and use a smaller wavelength, you will get a better resolution. On, on the lower part, I show here the X, the lab axis is the minimum feature size, and the right axis is the lithography wavelength, and the axis is the year of production. Now you can see the problem. You can see the crossover. When technology keeps scaling down, to now today with the 2022. So wavelengths did not catch up. Wavelengths did not catch up. Right? And that's why it, it stayed with the 193. People try to do uh, uh, another wavelength, 145, 154, did not work. So the last hole can come EUB 13.5. But it's not available. We need that by about 2005, but, but EUB is not available until recently. So this is a very difficult time for people working on the semiconductor, between semiconductor. Okay, so that's why MIT said, <laughs> MIT said, hey, most are really dead. People cannot people stop in 20 nanometer because people don't have the good lithography to define the feature below 28. And guess what? People are creative. People are creative, and people start okay. We start with some 193 nanometers dry for lithography. And a uh, few years later, people invented one is three immersion lithography. When you use immersion, you have the your optical constant is 1.35, 1.30%, 1.3, uh, 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 higher than, uh, than air. So you get 30% more improvement. And in, in, the mid, in the middle, there's a, a phase shift mask, which give you a 2x improvement of the, of the uh, resolution. The, for process integration, people create called SATP, self-aligned double patterning, or there are some other alternatives you call LELE, little edge, little edge. And later, people have the SAQP, self-aligned quad patterning. Dual patterning give you 2x improvement resolution. Quad patterning give you 4x improvement resolution. This actually propel and support support the uh, uh, IC manufacturing before. 2000, at the time without EUB, right? So it's a very challenging, but as I said, nobody's sitting idle. In, in, in doing the work on silicon technology, nobody's sitting idle. People create a many, many innovation and to overcome this problem. Okay, finally, EUB is here. EUB is here. Well, the well, left side shows a very, very simplified uh, 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 diagram of the EUB. What what different than the previous technology, previously software technology, 193 nanometer is UB use uh, refractive optics, refractive optics before using transmissive, just like your camera, your light come in and you you have the uh, uh, your uh, image sensor in the behind the, the lens, but this is no your your uh, your image will be on the same side, your image will be on the same side for the light coming in. Why is that? Because at 13.5 nanometer wavelengths, a lot of materials will absorb, will absorb the wavelengths and the, the, the intensity of, of the photolithography. So you are not able to, to get a good quality of image. So everything is refracted. And today the best uh, uh, refractivity is about 70% per mirror. And uh, for the regular NA, it's about we talk about the uh, six, we need the six mirrors, and you, you can calculate yourself, right? We're down to about 15% efficiency. If you inject the one, one kilowatts, you only get uh, uh, 150 uh, watts coming out, right? So, very, very inefficient, very, very electrical, inefficient, right? What I show here is a, a system component of the ASML, the only company in the world can make. Uh, 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 EUV, right? So people coming out say, hey, um, well, EUV is a one time solution. We're able to at least last for 10 years to enable uh, Amazon era, right? I, I think, I think th th this is very, very possible. The so reason I showed the previous page, you say, hey, EUV need to repeat the process integration optimization pre EUV, right? They need to do this uh, double patterning and quad patterning 
uses the IET resolution enhancement technique, then I think the next 10 years should not have problem. The only problem probably electricity, right? As people come here, these foreign come from <laughs> people in Taiwan, right? And you know that with Taiwan, we are lack of the uh, uh, electricity, right? Today is uh, electricity usage, EUV electricity usage equal to the three regions of the East Taiwan, right? Yilan, Hualien, Taidong, that's equal to the, 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 the uh, UV imagine. Imagine that if further we use more UV, that will be uh, issues, or be issues. Okay, that's the lithography I want to talk about materials. Uh, in 1980, 1980, you look at the periodic table. Semiconductor uses about 12 elements in the periodic table. And in uh, 2000, people already use about 80% of elements on the periodic table. Now it's 2020, and uh, uh, there's a not only the 80 percent we use, people also use the uh, uh, binary, ternary, and quaternary, and quaternary uh, materials. Very, very complicated, and also changing from 3D to 2D to 1D. 1D carbon nanotube, 2D is 2D material I, I showed previously and showed in the next foil, and next foil showing the uh, the 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 current progress to, in my view, is the automated device, 2D uh, device. The candidate is uh, TMDC, TMT, transition metal dichalcogenide. You show the table there, charcogenide is a yellow part, sulfur, selenium, and terrarium. And coupled with the transition metal, the most commonly used is molly and the tungsten. Right, we see the molly, uh, da sci fi uh, or tungsten da sci fi, there can you make for that. One is MOS, one is BMOS. But with this new material, all the contact structure need to be re engineered. Game material needs to be re engineered. And, uh, and, uh, and, and people talk about the semi metal is a contact. This moves arsenic and antimony, which is a low, very, very low temperature. So it's, it's still it's still a long way to go, but many good programs have been shown in last few years, right? If we recall that, that uh, transistor architecture, this is the last one. So I, we still have time to do that, right? Another material challenge I want to talk about is, uh, is, is uh, metallization. Here shows the uh, effective metal receptivity as a function of the metal width, metal line width, right? We do a scaling, we want to move smaller, smaller line width. You can see the, the receptivity increase very, very high, very, very high. People changing from tungsten aluminum to copper, but still not enough to suppress this, right? Because due to a lot of scattering inside the grain. And a lot of material now is being looked into that, and a lot of people into roll back, right? It's not all the, all the woods there, as it was on there, but, but it could impact, it could impact uh, IC manufacturing. So really, really careful about this one. The last one on top of the, the 3D packaging. Okay, here show the, the historical trend on the packaging. Start from 1D wire bonding, 2D flip chip, 2D MCP, 2.5D silicon interposer, and the finally is the 3D chip lab, which is a hot topic recently. We now stacking die together, stacking, stacking the die together. So which is, is part of most law. <laughs> Sometimes people call this the most law 2.0 or something, right? You go to, if you think about, and this is some example of this 3D packaging. Left hand side is uh, 2021 Intel Architecture Day shows that Intel combined the, the CPU and the HBM high bandwidth memory and the IO die analog device. Center one shows the AMD the GPU and the right hand side shows the Xilinx APGA. People start using this as, as an idea to further extend the, the most law, right? Okay. I want to summarize all this learning into one page. 1965 to 2000 is classical scaling, all dimension. Dimension here, I show the device length, device width, device height, package height, 0 0.7, 0 0.7, 0 0.7, 1x. But running out of steam in 2000. Then we had 2D innovative scaling using mobility improvement, 
diagnostic uh, high care diagnostic material and in film fair performance, we don't need to stick with that 0.7 point sensor. We can flexible trade off between one number and to the other number. Actually, gain length is very difficult to achieve to, to make it smaller. So actually, I can see a recent data that people have thrown down the gain length uh, 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 scaling, but in, instead compensate by, by something else, right? The famous one is uh, DTCO, Design Technology Cooperation, right? And, but also this needs to be uh, uh, supported by the 3D. In the right hand side, you can see it's a briefly show that with going to the third dimension, you don't need to stress, you don't need to stress the X and Y that much. You can use Z direction, reverse scaling to help you achieve uh, 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 area scaling. Of course, we cannot forget about the, the packaging, doing the 3D packaging. So it's, packaging is a reverse scaling. Instead of 1x, we will go to 2x, 3x, you stack more and more tight together, right? And we, then we still can achieve the uh, 0.5 per two years, but get a lot of still the same performance and power benefit. And this I call asymmetry scaling. Okay, and the final part of my presentation, I'll look at the most law. Okay, first one, of course, long is the most low. I think my projection it can be deep another 10 years. But we're now out of woods here. We make a lot of progress. But from the, my 32 years experience of most law, I think this, I, I have never seen the, this promising as of now, right? Based on most recent progress, we resolve the device architecture. People don't do need to go to this. this is, other all kinds of structural people, but say when everybody synchronized, there's a roadmap there. Lithography, we got UV, normal materials, and we got a 3D packaging. Oh, everything is there, right? So, uh, and I think, I think that the model will continue because the technical factors is no longer a threat, right? However, I want to point out non-technical factor may have deeper influence, right? And the next thing here shows that if you follow the 3D, right, don't stick with the original DNA model 0 0.7, 0 0.7, 0 0.7. You, there's a lot of flexibility, a lot of it can, can extend the most. Law. However, however, I want to finish the, my presentation with this for you. The IT ecosystem and the limit of most. Law. Here I show the, the most law here, as I presented previously. Then I show the input of most law is all this uh, device, architecture, equipment, EUB, 2D, 3D material, 3D packaging. This is the input of Moslo. And output of Moslo is all these device, hard drive, NAN, DRAM, CPU, flat panel, image sensor, uh, anything like that. And with that, system integration, build a, 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 even a, a, a deeper product, right? Data center, cloud computing, Gaming and uh, and uh, very very really good uh, 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 camera and even bigger and bigger digital TV right and final is that people talk about uh you did it for a lot of really new ideas 5G 6G and uh, AI and autonomous driving and uh, don't forget the electric the vehicles right so my 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 vision is this one technical factor is is not is not a, a factor for next 10 years or more so however i want to point out the endpoint market could be the endpoint non-technical market could be because you if industry cannot find a product which people like it people will, will need to spend money on that and 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 the if there's no funding to support the, all the the very challenging development of most of them most of can can stop but not it's not a fault most of is the, the end product second factor i want to point out is political factor as everybody knows that if, if war has some political factor that it could stop and disrupt the the uh, uh, keep improving of most all right this is my last foil thank you for your patience and uh, i just you know i'm very great to be here to share my learning with everybody which from Taiwan, it has said in the beginning, I'm actually in Taipei right now, sitting in, in, in my sister's house there. All right.
<laughs> okay. Thank you very That's much, Dr. Jin. Thank you very much, Dr. Jin, for the very uh, awesome presentation. And I think we have uh, time. I have time for one question. So I'll I'll call out the question from our audience, Rex Chen. Uh, his question is. With the novel advance in these new technologies, for example, 3D device architecture, 3D packaging integration, and lithography like EUV, can you comment on whether this advance will ultimately bring more or less cost on the per chipset level for chipless, uh, for fabless customers? I think the question, my understanding is that uh, with the advancement of the technology, and what will be the trade-off between better performance and higher cost? Oh, hey, I didn't mention cost at all, right? <laughs> I'm focused on the technical factor. Okay, uh, you ask the physicist, the theoretical limit of the transistor is 1.5 nanometer, which is called the uncertainty principle, right? Uncertainty principle, uh, delta P times delta X must be less than the H bar. Right, delta x is a dimension, and you do all kind of calculation. You know, the the uh, the limit of the device is one point five nanometer. But I want to pull out this for you again. With this kind of three D stacking, you don't really need to change the your your gate length dimension very very close to the number. You can live with uh, a number of people feel comfortable today, with about five to ten nanometer, by adding more layers on that. Right now, you say. Uh, 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 people say, hey, this will increase the cost, right? But actually, with the improvement of the productivity, this cost, cost increase is not that much. Cost increase is not that much, especially when you have very, very outstanding product coming out from this the AI and some other thing. You will, you, people will, will enjoy the, the, the outcome for, for, for the most role. Right. Any other question? Yeah. Any other question? Uh, yeah, so we have one minute, so a quick question. So the question is about design for manufacturing. Uh, what's the challenging along with the new process evolution? Three, like for example, 3D IC, uh, DRC, design road, road check, and heating. <laughs> good, very good question, actually, because these are main complaints on the receiving side of the most law, right? This, people say, hey, uh, Jahon, your product is, uh, uh, you know, your DRC design rule is too complicated now, right? And uh, and uh, uh, and a lot of things, the cost may be higher and the design may be more difficult, right? But I, I will call a one very important partner for most law is designers. Is designer. I mentioned the DTC or Design Technology Core Organization. Designer need to accommodate most law to change when when technology become more and more complicated. This this uh, uh, design will be could be harder, right? And but we so but right now has uh, AI and EDA, right? Actually, you can do the automation. A lot of things that can be resolved quickly, right? So I don't think this is a problem. But we need to we need the support. On the design community. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Jen. Very fantastic uh, presentation and QA. I'll hand Thanks. over the uh, to the next moderator uh, uh, for for Tianlin for introduction for the next uh, presentation. Awesome. Can you guys see me? Okay. Awesome. Um. Our, we will have our next uh, speaker, um, and it's a very a topic I I believe a lot of people are very curious about about the Chips Act, and we have Dr. Eric Breckenfield. Dr. Eric Breckenfield is the director of technology policy at Semiconductor Industry Association, where he directs associations R and D and workforce development efforts. Please join me to welcome Eric Breckenfield. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Let me um, go here and try to share my uh, try to share my screen. Uh, 
All right, how does that look? Can we see that okay? Yeah, it looks good. Thumbs up, fantastic. All right, so thank you all so much for having me here. And uh, you know, when I put together this talk, I didn't realize what a great introduction and transition uh, presentation I was gonna have before me with Dr. Jan. Uh, did, did a fantastic job of laying out the case for where the technology's at and, and why you know, a lot of the roadblocks we're going to face at least over the next 10 years or so are not gonna come from technology roadblocks and innovation roadblocks, but from, uh, you know, what what some may call secondary concerns. So so really fantastic setup for that. Th thank you so much, Dr. Chen, for, for laying that groundwork for me. Um, and uh, I'll just say, if um, I'm actually recovering from COVID this week, so if my voice gets a little bit gravelly, I, I apologize in advance. So uh, what I want to talk to you all about today, uh, which I uh, colloquially call Chips and Salsa, is about the 2022 Chips and Science Act uh, that, that was passed by U.S. Congress, uh, signed by President Biden in August, and, and now is looking towards implementation. And, and, and just for the record, um, we did try very hard to get it to be formally called the Chips and Salsa Act. And, and there were actually several congressional staffers who had a salsa acronym for, for what that might mean. And, and we came very close to having that uh, become the, the formal title, but that, that, that's not ultimately the direction it went, sadly. Um, so just very briefly, an uh, introduction about myself and, and uh, our, our, uh, our organization, the Semiconductor Industry Association. So uh, my name is Eric Breckenfeld. I'm the Director of Technology Policy there. As, as stated in my intro, I oversee our research and development and workforce policy portfolio areas. Uh, the SIA broadly uh, is made up of Oh, here we go. Made up of many member companies, not only in the U.S. Our, our charter companies, meaning those on our board, are have to be wholly owned within the U.S. But beyond that, uh, we we have many international companies and companies who are international but who operate within the U.S. So, I think the the Semiconductor Industry Association membership represents um, something like 90, 95 percent of the uh, global. Uh, non-Chinese semiconductor uh, production market. So, uh, you know, we we uh, we we talk to to a lot of a lot of folks, uh, companies who who I'm sure are on the uh, on the Zoom here today. Um, and, you know, at the very beginning, I'll also just broadly say that it has been our recommendation and advocacy as, as we look towards the implementation of the Chips Act that international companies who do work in the US and because of the global nature of the supply chain you know most global companies in the semiconductor space have some significant work in the US as well um, that those not be excluded from the chips act funding or or sets of activities or collaboration and that international collaboration is is going to be one of the most important parts of chips act implementation uh, that will determine ultimately the, it's it's uh, success or failure over the next 10 years um so just sort of very very briefly um you know what does the chips act do is a is a pretty good question and and one that we we get quite a lot um and and this slide here kind of just helps set up um the three big bins that the funding falls into there's a funded part of the chips act that's the chips act part and then there's a non-funded but authorized part that's the end science part and i can talk about the finer details of that a bit later but the funded part the part that's actually getting money directly appropriated from congress falls into three big bins those bins are the 39 billion dollars in manufacturing incentives the 25 percent manufacturing investment tax credit which was scored by the congressional budget office at at 24 billion and then 13 billion dollars in in r d and workforce investment and you know, if you look at the timescales over which these three areas are supposed to be improving the semiconductor innovation ecosystem, it's really nearest term, medium term, and long term. And the 39 billion is really targeted at how do we make sure that these investments, that, that we uh, add incentives to sort of level the playing field versus say standing up capacity in, for example, China, uh, and, and make sure that that companies aren't paying too much of a premium to come and stand it up in the U.S. and participate in the the sort of freer side of the of the supply chain. The 25% manufacturing investment tax credit 
stays good over uh, a, a period of years, but doesn't have an application process. So, so these uh, manufacturing incentives, this will be a program that companies will apply to. They will have packages and, and plans of investment that will include a, a lot of areas that I'll talk about later, but that, these are incentives that will be directly applied to, and, and those will roll out uh, quite quite shortly. I would expect o over the next probably four months, we will have information about it, and then over the next year, we should start to see those incentives programs roll out. Um, but then this this $13 billion in R&D investment, really, I see as... as Oddly enough, as, even though it is the smallest bin of money, by far the most important bucket of funding as, as it really sets the stage for the future of transitioning earlier stage R&D and innovations. And, and a lot of what Dr. Chen talked about, I mean, that represents sort of that that those innovations in the pipeline, making sure those get transitioned up into scalable technologies and then eventually hand off to companies to find their way into products. And so this $13 billion is about setting up an infrastructure, in part government funded and also uh, with, with some cost sharing from industry and making sure that that infrastructure is established, is healthy and is sustainable. So uh, one thing that we're gonna, we're gonna have a, a, as, as a bit of a recurring theme here is uh, there's a lot to talk about here. I can't put all the information up here because first of all, it's, uh, changing constantly and and second of all uh there's just too much of it out there so i'm gonna have some some slides where i send you to external resources if you have more questions one of those is chips.gov chips.gov is the landing page for the chips act and all official information about how any of these programs are going to proceed will find its way on chips.gov this is where announcements are made this is where notices of funding opportunities can be found i, I highly urge all of you, you there, there's a mailing list you can sign up for on chips.gov if you would like uh to, to get updates as they come out so i, I urge all of you to go to chips.gov but so this was set up for those of you not terribly fluent in the um nuances of, of the uh, US executive branch, I'll, I'll have a bit of a slide here that shows the structure of, of how all of these offices talk to each other. But in essence, under the administration, there is a, a agency called the Department of Commerce. The Department of Commerce has an agency underneath that called the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST. So NIST is responsible for managing a lot of these programs. The, the R&D program falls under NIST, the manufacturing incentives fall under NIST, and NIST in turn falls under the Department of Commerce, which is under the White House. Commerce stood up this website and Commerce has been coordinating with other US agencies that participate in semiconductor research and development or our customers, in the case of the Department of Defense, are also customers of semiconductor technology. Uh, they have been coordinating with those agencies to create some strategy documents and to help establish an administration level strategy. That strategy has not been fully publicly released yet. We have some documents that I'll point you to, but I just wanna kind of set the stage to say, there's actually still a lot that we don't know. And honestly, a lot of what what I do in my job at SIA is is when when companies or or other stakeholders come and talk to me, uh, a lot of what I do is tell them that, don't worry, you're not the only one who doesn't know this this answer. It hasn't been released yet, and so that that may be a lot of what we talk about here today too. Um, and so there are some documents on this slide that have been released that I would also urge you to go take a look at. One of them is the PCAST recommendation document. PCAST is a President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. This is a group of advisors from industry, from academia, and, and also from government that, that advise the administration on science and technology matters. They released a recommendation document about a month ago for the CHIPS Act research and development and workforce provisions. Uh, it is not officially binding. It, it's not a document from the administration. It's a document from this Council of Advisors to the administration but it contains a lot of detailed implementation guidelines on what kinds of technologies do they think are important how do they think the research and development infrastructure should be set up i, I highly urge you all to go read that it's not a terribly long document but it contains a lot of great recommendations that the administration uh, may, may very well follow when they are looking to how they would like to do all of this and then finally, there's also a, a national strategy on, on um, microelectronics research, which is, is really a thorough document that was released um, 
around the same period of time that is a deep dive into the technologies that they believe are of interest. Many of, of the technologies mentioned in, in Dr. Jan's slides previously and beyond um, that, that they think that the uh, CHIPS Act and, and in particular the National Semiconductor Technology Centers should be pursuing as a high priority for, for technologies of interest. And there was an, an, a request for information issued uh, by the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy to inform that that has now closed, but many companies, uh, TSMC among them, uh, submitted responses to uh, to that RFI, and we're still waiting to see what the impact of uh, the RFI responses are on that. So I talked about a lot of stuff. Um, maybe I can sort of be helpful and, and show a confusing diagram for how this all fits together. So at the center here, we have the White House. This is the administration. Branching off from that, we have many offices and agencies. Front and center, this is the Department of Commerce. And within the Department of Commerce, there is this CHIPS program office. So this is really the authority. This CHIPS program office is the office making decisions around the CHIPS Act. They are informed by many other side groups and documents. <clears throat> One example is this on the upper left, uh, this CHIPS Implementation Steering Council that was established by executive order, uh, co-chaired by a whole bunch of folks in the government. This is a group that is providing input to the CHIPS program office and also to the, to the administration on all matters CHIPS. This is a lot of domain experts on microelectronics from, from within the government a, and also a lot of national security experts. Um, there's also in this lower left uh, quadrant here, this industrial advisory committee. This is a committee uh, made up of many leaders from industry as well as uh, US national laboratories and academia that directly uh, uh, sort of guide the CHIPS Act office in an informal capacity, provide advice on how these, how all of these uh, other strategies should kind of come together and be implemented. So this is really the, the way for industry to, to directly uh, give advice to this CHIPS program office. And then floating around that, there are all these documents I mentioned. So there's the President's Council of Advisors on Science, Science and Technology, also a group made up of uh, you know, industry leaders in, in um, industry technology leaders, I should say, uh, people from academia and, and, and these sorts of people from national laboratories. So they publish this document. There's also uh, over on the right here, this National Science and Technology Council document. And then the Department of Commerce also uh, back in, I, I want to say September, released their own strategy for the Chips for America Fund. I understand it's confusing. It's confusing for me. I have to keep track of all these things. They all say slightly different things about what the CHIPS Act should do, but they're all maybe around 30 pages each. I would urge those interested to see what they say to go take a look at those documents. They are all going to impact how the CHIPS Act is rolled out. All right, so hopefully I've done enough uh, sort of setting the table on who is influencing uh, how this is supposed to be rolled out and and you know what the structure of that is. Um, maybe it's helpful to kind of do a bit of a dive into, you know, what specifically is contained in the CHIPS Act? What's supposed to be funded? Where is this money intended to be going? And what do we know so far from the legislation and then also from what we've seen in these documents? So to start with, starting with the implementation grants, there's a lot that we know. Uh, I, you know, you don't have to, I'm not going to go through every single uh, bullet on this slide here, but basically, you know, we know a little bit about who has the authority for it. We know a bit about what the eligibility is going to be. There's still unknowns about these, but at least at a high level, we know uh, what's going to be contained in these implementation grants. And we have an idea of the process and timing in that we know that in February, the first sets of information are going to come out about these uh, grants and information will roll out beyond February to provide guidance on what sorts of metrics uh, programs will be judged by and questions like that. <clears throat> When we look at funding priorities, uh, the administration has made it very clear that, you know, they understand that leading edge logic is quite expensive compared to everything else. So, of course, it gets the, the lion's share of the money, but they also have money set aside for mature and trailing edge nodes and then also for other certainly for, for memory, but also for, for analog, for uh, RF and mixed signal systems, for MEMS um, that they're not leaving that out, but there is an understanding that the bulk of the money must go to the most expensive part of that, which is, of course, the leading edge logic. 
Um, and then also, you know, it's known that workforce and education, uh, workforce development and education partnerships are, are a part of this that cannot be ignored and that every major player in the supply chain, the U.S. and beyond, uh, m must understand that this industry will will uh, succeed or fail on the quality of its workforce and the quality of talent that we can attract uh, to to uh, the the technology areas of, of interest. So you know that can't be ignored, and, and workforce planning will be a part of need to be a part of any successful uh, proposal. So um, this is great. This is sort of what we know so far. Unfortunately, we're going to go to a slide where uh, there's even more bullets about what we don't know. And so there's a whole lot that we don't know that we're still waiting to hear about. And the administration, unfortunately, while they were very engaging with industry before the CHIPS Act was signed, now that it is law, they are uh, very cautious not to interface with any non-government entities in a way that's inappropriate or that um, gives an unfair advantage to to any one entity over another. So they're being very cautious in how they engage on these things. We may have to wait until February to get a lot of the answers to the questions here. Um, so understanding that many of these are the questions in everyone's mind, how many projects are there going to be? How big are they going to be? Uh, you know, can we have some more re re fine resolution in terms of the technologies of interest? You know, all of those sorts of things that we're, we're going to have to wait on. Um, the tax implementation. So th this is a period of time, and, and this is one I, I actually think has been somewhat undervalued in the conversation uh, in, in terms of how important it's going to be. So th this is a 25% uh, tax uh, credit for, for any qualified investments that by, um, by the legislation include any advanced manufacturing facilities that produce semiconductors or semiconductor manufacturing equipment. So, you know, in theory, this is a, a very broad set of of investments that could qualify for this. And uh, SIA is actually working on a document right now to, to, um, to advise the Department of the Treasury on what we feel would be uh, qualified investments for that. Um, but, but there is a timeline. And so the timeline of investment here is, is how long this tax credit is available for. Investments made outside this timeline, and that means before as well, do not qualify for that. And so uh, th th that's something important to know. And then finally, uh, onto the stuff that that I, I personally believe is the most important, uh, the research in the workforce. So th there are four big buckets of funding, and then one bucket of unfunded uh, efforts that that the research and development areas fall into. Uh, I, there, these top right, top left, and uh, bottom left quadrants all fall under the Department of Commerce, uh, mostly through NIST, and these are the National Semiconductor Technology Center, the National Advanced Packaging Manufacturing Program, and the Manufacturing USA Semiconductor Institutes. And so very briefly, the National Semiconductor Technology Center, or it could be plural centers, and if you look at what was recommended in this PCAST document I referred you to earlier, they recommend six centers of excellence for the NSTC here, uh, focused in the technology areas of uh, logic, memory, analog, packaging, design, and then uh, a sixth center that would handle semiconductors, um, semiconductor technologies that apply to key emerging technologies. Their, their example was life sciences. So a center that focuses on semiconductor technologies as they impact life sciences. But that would be sort of a, um, a flexible center that, that could uh, change as new emerging technologies become important. Uh, then there's the National Advanced Packaging Manufacturing Program, which is intended as a set of programs that could establish within the U.S. a, a uh, innovation pipeline for packaging. As, as I'm sure many of you probably know, there hasn't historically been much packaging innovation uh, done in, on U.S. soil. U.S. companies have been involved in it, but, but they've typically done it elsewhere in the world. And so there's, there's a desire to help boost the packaging, especially the advanced packaging ecosystem in the U.S. So that's what this is intended to do. And by the way, these top two programs are envisioned to work in a highly uh, coordinated way. It, it, you know, the, the, um, the administration is keenly aware of the fact that, that packaging and the core semiconductor technologies uh, c cannot be easily separated. And then in the lower left here, there's these Manufacturing USA Institutes. Um, th these are a, at a smaller scale than the uh, National Semiconductor Technology Center. 
but uh, th they are intended to be a little bit earlier in the innovation pipeline. And, and I'll have a slide about that earlier, but you can envision that um, these would handle some, some very specific groups of technologies that maybe uh, would be not quite broad enough to qualify for an NSTC center, though the NSTC center that corresponds to that may still be involved in that area. So let me give you an example. Um, one area being discussed right now is a manufacturing USA Institute focused on heterogeneous integration that would then partner with the NSTC Center of Excellence around packaging. And so th that's one example, but just that these manufacturing USA institutes are, are intended to be a, a little bit more specific. I'll note that there is currently a request for information out on these manufacturing USA institutes. And so now is the time for, for anyone who would like to submit a response to that to influence what they think uh, these these uh, manufacturing USA institutes really be focusing on. Um, and, and that RFI closes, I, I believe, November 28th. Um, and then finally, there, there's a pot of money, uh, $2 billion, that has gone not to commerce, but to the Department of Defense. And that's to provide a semiconductor defense fund uh, to support, among other programs, uh, what, what's being floated around as this idea for the Department of Defense Microelectronics Commons, which is sort of a network of academic and government labs that would be uh, sort of scaled up and enhanced with some production equivalent equipment, um, maybe some, some um, you know, 200 millimeter wafer processing equipment, things like that, that would kind of serve in between as an in-between step for academia to, to scale the technologies that the Department of Defense could leverage for some of their more unique needs. Uh, you know, the DOD has a, a, a very different uh, approach to semiconductor technologies and microelectronics than the commercial sector because they operate at much smaller scales. And, and oftentimes, Department of Defense may only buy devices numbering in the hundreds or, or low thousands when you, you would obviously typically be finding devices in the millions and beyond in the commercial sector. And so that's just a unique set of needs. And, and there's a separate uh, smaller pot of money for that. It, it's not totally clear how the DOD pot of funding is going to interact with the other pots of funding, meaning could the DOD programs leverage the National Semiconductor Technology Centers? Could, could they be an annex within those or something like that? That's not clear yet. That's the type of information I'm referring to when I say we're still waiting to hear the broad strategy. So we don't know answers like that just yet. This is the slide I was talking about. So uh, what, what we have plotted here is on top, US agencies that fund semiconductor research and development plotted on an axis of basic research up through scaling to production. And so you don't have to go read every single agency here, but of course, you know, NASA's on here, DARPA's on here, Department of Energy, NIST, um, you know, all, all sorts of agencies are on here. And then on the bottom, these are examples of institutes, U.S. and, and one international with IMEC, that perform this R&D, and, and the funding they receive is typically provided by these top funders. Um, and, and what I really want to show here isn't necessarily to, to go and, and, and read what they all are, but to show that there already is uh, an established pipeline and a tapestry of innovation here. But if we look at the color coding, a lot of the more mature funding buckets and organizations that handle that technology transition from maybe early stage and applied R&D up through prototyping and piloting, a lot of those are Department of Defense and Intelligence community serving. And if we take those away, for the more broadly serving activity ranges, there actually is this gap that emerges. And, and, and that's what helps lead to this valley of death and this difficulty in transitioning technologies, you know, this lab to fab transition that's so difficult. And so this is really where the National Semiconductor Technology Centers by, by the legislation are envisioned to live and are intended to help improve the health of that ecosystem and improve that key missing step of that pipeline to make sure that sort of as, as Dr. Jan mentioned in his talk, you know, we don't the, the technology path is clear, but how do we make sure that we don't have these non-technology problems getting in the way of these innovations becoming real technologies and real products? And, and you know, before I, I was at SIA, I was at DARPA for four years, and I saw this constantly when, when there was a failure to find a transition partner. Technologies 
that that are very promising and and ha- had quite a lot of R and D money devoted to them end up on a shelf somewhere because they don't have an adequate transition partner. And so that that's the exact problem that the NSTC is is intended to be a part of the solution to. Of course, it, it's companies who take the baton pass from the NSTC. And so without buying in from the companies as well, the NSTC can't become a healthy part of the ecosystem. So, so that's extremely important as well. Um, this is a breakdown of sort of the, how the funding for the uh, different programs evolve over time. You can tell clearly that uh, it's very front loaded. There's a, there was an, an understanding among Congress that a lot of this will need to go towards infrastructure investment, which will naturally front load that money. But I'll note that um, this money is valid until it is spent. So it doesn't expire in that calendar year. So that, that's a very important distinction for government funding. Um, so, so this is the fastest that the Department of Commerce can spend this money, but they can spend it more slowly than that if they would like to. Um, I want to circle back around to one thing I mentioned earlier where I said there was this bucket of unfunded projects. So um, the way that, that uh, US Congress gives money is they, they have what's called authorized funding and appropriated funding. So appropriated funding is when they actually give more money to an agency to do a, a enhanced set of activities. Authorized funding is where they tell an agency that they can spend money on a new set of activities, but they don't give them more money to do so. So that's authorized. So they're authorized to spend more money, but they're not given more money. So if they want to go do those activities, they'll have to pull money out of existing programs. Appropriated funding means Congress is giving them more money to go do that. So I just want to be clear because there's there's about $170 billion worth of authorized funding in the Chips and Science Act for earlier stage R&D. And this is, you know, and th- there's a question I, 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 I saw come up at one point, which is, you know, how do we make sure that that really the early pipeline continues to be fed about this? And, and this is where this science part of this is so important and, and why SI is advocating that the the funding that Congress authorized in this next budget cycle, they then go and provide additional funding to because it's so important as an early uh, uh, feeder of innovation of of this infrastructure that they're going to set up. And I just want to note that um, this graph on the on the right shows uh, how uh, science appropriations have evolved over time. So real funding have evolved since 2008. And these dashed lines show increases in authorizations that were never realized. So these are, this is the America Competes Act from around the time of, of uh, the the housing crisis and, and a set of uh, uh, sort of, um, you know, funding opportunities that came from around that period of time. But many of those were authorized, but but then never funded. And so what we show on the right here in the shaded region is what would happen to science funding if that authorization turns into an appropriation. But if we look at historical examples, that hasn't always happened. So, so that's not guaranteed to be the case. Um, and then I'll, I'll go very quickly on this because I know we need to get to questions, but just that there's a whole lot in every single one of these, not only the manufacturing incentives, but also all of this R&D funding on workforce funding and workforce uh, development. and um, you know, every single part of this. So the R&D contains workforce training. The manufacturing incentives proposals will need to include uh, company workforce strategies and and probably partnerships with uh, with universities, with community colleges, with technical colleges, with apprenticeship programs, all of those sorts of things. So there's a huge amount of workforce uh, activity going on around this. And there needs to be more as well. So that's one area that SIA is advocating, you know, very strongly on right now, on how do we make sure that that we have the workforce support to realize all of this manufacturing capacity and these R and D asks. Um, there's specifically a workforce education fund that was set up under the National uh, Science Foundation. It's not clear what this is going to be used for yet. This is another one of those cases where there's this bucket of money that we don't have clear answers on, but uh, I would say stay tuned on that. We, we hope to know more early 2023. Um, and then I'll just finally leave you with um, everything that I've said here today. There's a more thorough description of in a document that SAA just released. We just released uh, our, our set of recommendations for the CHIPS Act Research and Development Funding. Uh, called American Semiconductor Research Leadership Through Innovation. You can find it on the SIA webpage. Uh, We we have recommendations in sort of five key areas. 
as well as, um, you know, we have some other activities going on with, with supporting R&D funding, but I, I urge you to go, to go to our website, check out that document, check out the PCAST recommendation, uh, check out the, the uh, NSTC document and, and, and go to chips.gov and, and sign up to receive updates uh, if, if you would like those. So uh, with all that, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. And I, I don't know how much time we have left. I think, I think a Thank you so much, Dr. Eric. And it's, um, can you see me? Okay, also, let's see, I'm really popped up. Thank you for your excellent talk, even just you just recovering from COVID. Um, it's very impressive. And thank you so much for your time and share about the impact for like short term, medium term, long term, and also point out all the resource our audience can be able to follow up in the future. So, yeah, we do have some questions for you. Um, and we have one live live question from Minghua Jiang. And the question is, um, is the US sub subsidized sustainable? After this CHIPS Act, will the US government need to give another round of subsidies to help company to set up more chip fabrication in the USA? Yeah, that's a great question. And one that we're highly uh, in, engaged uh, towards answering You know, every day as, as SIA. So I, I can't imagine that anyone who who's paying attention, who who knows what they're talking about, thinks you can buy the entire semiconductor supply chain forever for one investment of less than a hundred billion dollars. So, you know, th really, and and this is something I've I've tried to make clear whenever I engage with with Congress or or with the administration is that you know this is a lot of money for the U.S. taxpayer to give, but it's actually a small amount of money for the industry to receive, and so spending it wisely. And, and making sure that everything we set up has a plan for sustainability that doesn't depend on a, a, another injection of, of government funding. That's how it should be done. So making sure that when we talk about you know, the NSTC, when we talk about things like this, that there is a plan for companies to become involved, for some existing um, funding uh, uh, avenues that are, that are more permanent. So, you know, the, the U.S. government has existing revenue streams for R&D. So how do we make sure that those are flowing into it? How do we make sure companies are getting involved? How do we make sure that this whole thing is a value add so that it can be sustainable without requiring more government money? But towards your question, you know, is there an understanding? Yes, I, I, I think that, you know, there does have to be a circle back in a period of years where we say, you know, this was great, but Many of the the problems that that are out there aren't going away. The problems of steep initial investments in in you know capex things like that 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 doesn't go away. And so if if we want to stay competitive in this, there needs to be an exploration of additional funding. Actually, one area that SIA is highly engaged on right now too for advocacy is trying to make sure that tax credit sticks around. That, that that's. A, a big part of a portfolio for making sure that investing in the U.S. remains competitive over places like China, um, just because that cost difference is so large. But really, you know, I don't want to sound like a broken record here, but but this is one topic I'm willing to sound like a broken record on. Um, the way you stay competitive is workforce. And if we don't have the workforce that can do this, we don't have anything. And if we have the work, you know, this is something that, that Taiwan figured out. If we have the workforce, that makes everything else more sustainable. And so, you know, that that's really the the single biggest um I, I think point of failure or and and area of of you know where where success is the most important. Awesome. Yeah, thanks so much for pointing out like the aspect maybe where we can get like more funding and just like stay competitive. Um and just quickly want to like uh, squeeze one more question in. Um and that question is. The U.S.-China Chip Act would encourage China to develop its own technology. Do you think it would be a long-term gain from the U.S. point of view? What would be the impact on the semiconductor supply chain, especially in Taiwan? Yeah, I think that so, um, you know, unfortunately, that's an answer I could do its own 30-minute or, or one-hour talk on. Um, I'll, I'll say that answering those questions sort of backwards, um, I think that very little of the upstream semiconductor supply chain to Taiwan passes through China. Um, I think that downstream products get made in China. And, and so there's that impact. But I don't think that just in terms of supply chain, 
China doesn't impact Taiwan's ability to manufacture semiconductors. Most of the upstream equipment and materials come from the U.S., come from Japan, or come from within Taiwan itself. And so I, I don't see that as, as a huge risk. Um, now, this risk of, of developing their own internal, you know, I, certainly that's on the table, and, and that's what we saw in many technology areas. Um, I, I do think that semiconductors, although both depending heavily on silicon, semiconductors are different to manufacture than, say, solar panels, and they're much more difficult. And in order to stand up a fully domestic supply chain, there are a lot of missing pieces that China does not possess. You know, certainly the most obvious, of course, are, are things like ASML and, and uh, uh, EUV equipment, but but also, um, you know, EDA tools. Th those can be, you know, it, it can be easy to get those illicitly, but, but getting support on those is challenging. And so there, there's a whole, my point is that there's a whole range of technologies upstream that pass through Japan, pass through Taiwan, pass through U.S., and in some cases pass through the European Union as well, that are not easy to stand up from scratch. And even with many billions of dollars invested over a 10 year period of time, uh, it, it's still possible to fail on those. So, you know, do I think that, that China has the ability to stand up their own and, and with, you know, US limits on technology imports, could they do it? I, I certainly think that they could, but it's not guaranteed. It's going to be expensive and there is still a high chance of failure. And so that, that's sort of what I would broadly say about that. Awesome. Thanks so much, Eric. Um, thank you so much for your time. It's really thank you guys for having to me. Have you. No. So, so then now we are going to go to our third speaker. Um, but yeah, very quickly, just want to shout out for the audience that thank you so much for bringing great questions and um, sorry from the time limits, we cannot get over all the questions you have, but we'll try to get speaker if they are available to answer and we'll share the answer through Nadia's Facebook group or in future newsletter. And also for audience um, staying, we unlock a new feature for you that if you want to upload question your q and pod, now you are able to do so. And now our next topic um, is for the advantage of Taiwanese companies in EV supply chain. And I saw some audience already show that they have um, interest in electric vehicles, but now the, I believe it's a, not, it's a topic that you don't want to miss out. And we have our uh, speaker, Steve Huang here. Um, and brief introduction, Dr. Steve Huang is the special assistant of chairman and senior vice president of Pegatron Corporation, where he focused developing 5G, AI, AR, VR, electric vehicles, and cloud uh, computing technology 5C product lines, computing, consumer, communication, car, healthcare since 2016. Please join me to welcome Steve Huang. Hi, I'm Steve Huang. Uh, thank you all about it. all the friends from the Bay Area and uh, worldwide to join this uh, uh, my presentation. And uh, I really appreciate, especially friends in the Bay Area, you are. Uh, uh, spend your Friday night and postpone your dinner with friends and then listen to my presentation. Thank you so much. So from uh, report last month, I learned the uh, uh, United States actually rely on uh, Taiwanese company to produce uh, uh, almost 90% of a high high end uh, semiconductor. So and also uh, most people know. Uh, Apple company actually rely on 100% the Taiwanese company to produce the iPhone related product. And also a very similar story is a uh, Taiwan company and responsible for 70 to 80% of noble PC manufacturer uh, shipped to worldwide. Uh, Taiwan is really play a very important role in the industrial. And now for the very hard topic, uh, the electric vehicle, and how is the Taiwanese company doing? And uh, uh, is there any advantage Taiwanese company will continue to do that? And uh, also for this actually quite old uh, industrial, actually almost 100 years, more than 100 years, car making industrial, is what's the opportunity Taiwanese company going to have? So this is today, uh, I'd like to tell you uh, my personal opinion to these questions. 
Okay, before that, we are doing some overview about the automotive uh, marketing. And uh, so, so uh, because uh, COVID-19, because the pandemic, and uh, uh, wait a moment, you can, button. So uh, because pandemic, uh, the automotive uh, saving a uh, drop a lot two years ago. And this is coming back uh, a little bit later, but I think the, uh, the situation will be, become better and better. So according to the report, the global automotive market will expect to reach uh, more than 100 uh, million sets. Uh, actually, it's a it report is 122 million by this decade. So to everybody, uh, also to town company, this is a very good industrial because uh, like uh, compared to the mobile phone and the uh, normal PC uh, saturation market, and then this is a really good market. But today I'd like to highlight is uh, for uh, the two reasons Taiwan company will play an important role in the electrical vehicle supply chain is the technology evolution and the supply chain transformation. So uh, let's look at the, the electrical vehicle, the sales situation. And um, probably I don't need to go very detail on this. Everybody expect the, uh, wait a moment. Okay. So I think everybody will see uh, this, uh, situation uh, nearby, uh, the electric vehicle is going to be growth very quickly. But key point is uh, people think about when the electric vehicle setting will surpass the fuel cars. Uh, 2027 is the year uh, the most people agree that uh, this is a course over year. So it's pretty close now, it's uh, less than five years now. So this is important. So let's talk about, as I know, I want to talk about two uh, key factors, technology evolution and the supply chain transformation. Let's talk about the later first, the supply chain transformation first. This chart show you the traditional automobile supply chain. You see the very famous car maker, the Volkswagen, Mercedes-Benz, BMW in the center. And uh, the so-called the tier one company, Bosch, Continental, ZF, they surround them. What, what this situation happened is uh, actually car maker doesn't lie like with familiar ICT, the computer phone company. Uh, they do own their own factory to manufacture, produce all the cars. You, I don't think, I, I know you, you don't think the Apple own the factory to build all the iPhone, billions of iPhone. They all don't produce their normal PC, their own, they don't uh, produce the no PC from their own factory. But car company actually own their own factory to build all the car company. So this keep them very busy and uh, they have to take care of everything. So they traditionally they rely on the so-called tier one to provide technology component module and uh, even the second tier, tier two, the component manufacturer, they rely on them. But this kind of situation will going to be changed uh, by some of the innovative, the electric vehicle company in Bay Area. Everybody knows there's a Tesla and also the Lucid, those kind of company. Um, some trend I did here is uh, first, uh, they adapt the technology for ICT industrial. So I'd like to let you know this is the key point that actually ICT ecosystem influence a lot the electrical vehicle, the supply chain, and supply chain or transformation from ICT ecosystem. So back to the this six point I highlight in red is the technology adaption is uh, since the uh, electrical vehicle, they share a lot of technology for the IC industrial. So they adapt all the categories. You can see the chart. Uh, electrical vehicle subsistence are these the 10 important subsistence for electrical vehicle. Uh, account at least the A subsistence, 
actually the technology has been adapted and used for a long time by phone, by normal PC. Battery, Wi-Fi, display, you know that. Even the camera also used a lot by phone and the uh, normal PC. So I see that's the only other technology. So why not just an EV maker, just a share the technology? They don't do, do for switch, right? A second thing, since they share the technology, they also want to share in the supply chain. Those supply chain has been used a long time and made quite well by the PC industrial and the phone industrial. So, and then let's go back to look how ICT company doing, how they manage the technology and the vendor management. Actually, ICT holds all the technology, critical technology on hand. There's a software and a component. And the ICT industrial, now they tend to manage all the component, uh, component vendors for some reason, like cost reduction and the shipping schedule control. And the most important I like to highlight here is software management. Because the ICT company like Apple, like, like uh, Google, they like to uh, own and uh, control all the high level software, the application software. So in the end, they have to work, the software engineer in the Apple or Google or Amazon, they have to work very close with a, a component vendor to integrate all the software because the component vendor like Taiwanese company that was a Broadcom, there was a Qualcomm, they install the development driver firmware on highway board. So this make the a giant company, industrial giant in Bay Area, they actually had to go directly, do directly with a Taiwan uh, manufacturer um, company vendors. So, so this trend actually also influenced the electrical vehicle company. Like we all know, we already know Tesla, they maintains all the software system and the uh, who says driving the software. This is very different from 10 years ago. The Volkswagen, the Benz, the Audi, they actually rely on tier one to provide software or the software SPD company to do that. But Tesla already done this. So we know the Volkswagen actually last year they established the 2000 hang, hang count the software uh, engineer in a lab. And they recognize this is a trend and they actually they talk between the car brand and the component vendor so they have the software and the firmware integration. So look at these five points. This is a conclude the supply chain in the electrical vehicle going to have a transformation. In the chart I put on the right hand side, they're going to form the hierarchy type to ring type in, and the supply chain. This is really influenced heavily by the ICT industrial. Now we, we talk about, uh, we switch gear to some uh, important technology evolution. This also impact the Taiwan company on electrical vehicle uh, uh, market. Three important technology I'd like to highlight here is a uh, modularization. This including two subtitle of the modular platform and all-in-one design. Second is uh, intelligence-oriented design. Uh, two subtopic is the ADAS, uh, driving assistance system, and the smart carpet. The third one is a uh, very new, innovative, the elect electronic architecture change, uh, evolution inside the car. And also OTA prevail uh, becomes a very important factor to put this uh, growth faster. But how these three technologies relate to uh, the, uh, so become so important? Let's uh, look at deeply what the car maker, what the car maker really focus on. Now, I think there's three points. This is easy understanding by uh, overs. First is cost. Uh, cost including the production cost, operation cost, material cost, engineer design cost, also, one key point is uh, I call it the space cost. What is the space cost? I think I make it like to uh, squeeze the all the component device into the very small 
a space so they can leave the more space for passenger and driver to enjoy the luxury car. So I call this the space cost. Uh, second thing they are really focused on is the safety. I think driving safety, driving attention, severity, component reliability, this is important. And the driving decision appetite. This means uh, its car can provide enough information, quick information, make the driver make decision quickly for the same safety reason. And the third one is uh, software is so important, dominant the whole car technology. So if software any defense, is, if we can uh, uh, update it quickly. So this is uh, also, uh, people may, maybe know it's really related to the OTA service. Uh, I will name it a little bit later. The last one is value. Car company that to provide more value on the car. So stylish, more variety, comfortable, more features, and uh, everybody focus on safe driving capability and uh, driving performance. People think about how we can drive like uh, say people zero to 65 miles, right? Three seconds, four seconds. People care this. And uh, also last one is uh, earning models. I think the four tasks is uh, really car maker create a value to consumer, but last one actually they try to create value for themselves. So they try to make more earning model, means that they want to they want to create more as a sale revenue for themselves. Uh, this is also very important. They are thinking about so these three key factor actually deeply related to the modulation that I put the cost green color. This is modulation and the EA evolution related. And the safety, all, all three important technology related. And the value, actually all three are related. I will spend some time to uh, describe a little bit about these three key technology evolution and how Taiwanese uh, company, they work on this. Okay, the first one, the modulation platform. Actually, platform concept is, an, is not new. I think the, uh, at the beginning from Henry Ford's generation, 100 years ago, uh, each production line produced uh, one model of a car. And when the number of model of car increase, they create a platform concept. So many, a few models, they share the same platform. So one platform need only one line and one platform uh, can support a few models. Also, uh, later on, the number of platforms also become more and more. And there's a new concept, it's a modular platform concept. Uh, they are raised in the, around the 2012, it's about 10 years ago. And this more complicated, but the, the, the fuel car, many companies defined by engine type, maybe the longitude, longitudinal type or latitude type for Volkswagen. So they call it, MQB and the MLB. And this also share that the car manufacturer share the production line uh, more efficiently. So, so today, uh, all the electric car uh, since uh, 2018, they transformed this kind of modular platform concept to all the electric car manufacturer. You see there's a uh, four company, they have uh, their own uh, uh, modular platform. Uh, they are doing now today in their factory like MEV for Volkswagen, like uh, the eGMP for Hyundai GM and, uh, and uh, Renault, this Nissan do the same things. The second type is all-in-one integration. You, you, see the, you see the situation that 10 years ago, Nissan Leafs actually, they use a separate inventor, uh, inventor motor yield bus. And this is spread out of the space also they increase, uh, they reduce the vehicle total reliability. And today, you see 10 years later, again, Nissan, they integrate everything together, uh, the inverter, motor, gearbox, and the BMS, the battery management system together, so they can provide uh, more space for the passenger, and they can increase the vehicle total reliability 
also they reduce the total vehicle weight uh, by cutting the number of the cable. Cable is a really uh, occupy the play space and also the weight in the vehicle. But, but people think about why, why they don't this earlier. Actually, this is not easy. You, you see in the Tesla Model Y, they integrate inverter, gearbox, and the motor. Uh, you integrate all the components together, it generate, it generate more heat. And the heat dissipation problem is more and more difficult to solve. Also, motor is a very a vibration component and never impact the inverter. So this is another difficulty you have to solve to do this uh, all-in-one integration design. So, so in Taiwan, actually, you uh, are quite famous. Uh, the, the consortium, the MH, Motion Mobility in Harmonic. This is also did by Fasca company. They do a lot of research on the platform. They try, try to sell the platform to uh, the company. They focus on their high-tech technology, maybe the safe driving uh, technology, so they can use the platform. Delta is a good company in Taiwan. They actually step-by-step uh, -step equate all the module for the car. Okay, second thing, technology I have to highlight is the ADAS and uh, some intelligence. So ADAS, actually, this is an assistant a driver. And this uh, really safe driving, the so-called level two. So now most of the car, they actually have this kind of, uh, like 65% the new car in this year, actually have ADAS. And we expect more in the future. Uh, typical ADAS function, they equip knee, equip the three to five millimeter way radars and the five cameras. So what ADAS are doing for you? Actually, two things, very simple. They try to let you avoid to hit the car in front and uh, try to keep inside the uh, separation of uh, white line so not to collide with the car uh, nearby. So it's just simple. So, so this is uh, when you uh, want to prevent hit a car in front, you have to have a radar, uh, long range radar in front of you. And you want to keep you your car inside the white line lane, or you cannot use the, the radar because the radar cannot detect the white line. You have to kill the camera and then use the AI fusion to tell you what's the line. So some other thing is that uh, like blind spot detection and people use the corner radar to detect and also the then change you they use the core radar in front to detect the car by you one thing is more also important is that people enjoy the surround uh surround view so like a bird view you can see you can control uh, you can handle, you can know all the situation around you from the every iteration. So it, you can feel more safety to drive. Another thing for intelligent uh, oriented, oriented design is a smart carpet. So smart carpet try to meet, make uh, the driver more comfortable and more smart to drive your car. For te technology here, I highlight uh, including the main vehicle interface, the touchscreen, voice recognition, actually you can know this all the shared technology from the ICT industrial. And also the big screen that we, to integrate three traditional screen, the dashboard screen on the driver's side, control screen to control your uh, air count and can see your video from the driver's side, and also the passenger seat screen. That, that Benz, this example, Benz actually have a new car, EQS. They integrate all that. They make you feel more smart and more luxury in the car. The third one is AR and uh, heads up display. So HUD actually normally they show some of the car speed and the other information to you. But, but people that's most vacant actually they already integrate uh, uh, augmented reality view a virtual image to the rear road sign, rear road scene. So driver can easy to know the situation and get a clear indication how to drive. The third one actually is important and then this will become the 
uh, the mandatory requirement even from government, there's a driver monitor system. Make sure a driver is uh, in good condition to drive the car. But remember, uh, the car maker, they won't use the camera now because uh, uh, privacy reason. They Most people, most company use the uh, infrared and to detect the uh, driver face and they use the AI uh, to know all the situation on that. So for this kind of smart uh, technology, I like to highlight some company like the sensor. QTech is a good company in Taiwan. Uh, there's a, a sale, another radar, and they develop a good company, a radar, long term radar, long range radar, corner radar in the world. Uh, this company that is from my NTU double E department, Chris uh, So I promote for him. Anyway, uh, for smart carpet, uh, beside the some giant display company, AUO in the Inno Dust. Pegasus, my company also do a lot on this. We we uh, cooperate with a display company and we build on, not only a display, we also build the e-carpet for EVA system. And we're going to launch the project in Taiwan soon. So we integrate a display with all the smart device Pegasus uh, create for e-bus and the data understand car. The last one I have to highlight the technology is uh, electric and electronic architecture and OTA. So long time ago, maybe in the Henry Ford generation, there's no electric electronic component inside a car. But gradually, people have a power window, people have a, a power door or the rain brush control, and even the wire driving technology become popular. Uh, more and more electric component used in a car. And people use the ECU, they call ECU, electric uh, control unit. And this created some problem is uh, more and more ECU adapt in a car. Like 4th March, 2019, they're almost 100 ECU, this is more complicated. And they, between ECU, there's a cable. Cable as long as uh, 10 kilometer, there's an incredible, a lens. So, so people think about how to do that. Like uh, 2020, the Volkswagen ID3, they actually they collect all the relay, the function like telematic, ADAS, power motor, car body, infotainment, issue into five groups. They use a more powerful domain CPU to control the portion. And they use a gateway to connect all the domain compute, computer together. So they can reduce the ECU number a lot and uh, make sure the cable length. But Tesla have another idea. The Tesla Model 3 actually, they put the very powerful server inside the car. You, you know, in the Bay Area, the NVIDIA, many companies, they have a very good server technology. So Tesla share the technology and put the whole server so that actually they can do anything they want. And also they put some the zonal computer to compare the whole car control. So the ECU number actually reduced even further and the cable length and the even shorter. Uh, some people say this will go to be the trend, but I don't like to make the decision, uh, the document, the, the confirm this yet. Because uh, server is complicated uh, device and the software is very complicated, but European company, maybe they want to stay on the domain architecture and they're familiar that time. So I think these two, the architecture will uh, grow together for the coming few years. Uh, this, these two architecture can support OTA uh, with a different kind of strategy and the methods. So OTA is important now. Uh, OTA, actually this also learned from ICT. I know you, you uh, your iPhone, iOS, have to download uh, from the air. So can make a thin OTA technology, actually they can uh, create more at sale revenue for this kind of uh, technology by subscription service. I did some uh, uh, example here, right here. And uh, even a friend of mine in China, they said Chinese, they make car, they actually already put 
additional battery inside a car. Say you pay money, buy a car can run uh, 500 kilometer in one charge. And naturally they put more battery can support 800 kilometer. So when you sometimes you want to drive long, long distance to other city, you can call a car dealer and they turn on the, the additional battery so you can enjoy long distance, but you have to pay maybe 100 US dollar per day and for one day. So, so this kind of another, uh, opportunity for the car maker to create more revenue after selling the car. Uh, Pegatron, actually, we um, research and uh, study and actually we build a car computer and for some the uh, car company right now. And Carola, Carota is a company, town company. I know their CEO quite well. They are they share about 40% of the OTA market in China. So Taiwanese actually do a lot of things on this. Uh, besides the, those the three key technology evolution, Taiwanese are going to get market share in the electrical car component. Also for these three important special component technology for electrical vehicle is a uh, mechatronics, electronic and the battery. They also another company, they already pay a lot of effort on this for long years. This three really is uh, not, sure, not sure by the field car, only used by electric, electric vehicle technology. Be beyond this, uh, actually Taiwan have many, many uh, very hidden, we say hidden miniere, uh, they create the industrial, they create another technology. They sure have a many big market share on that in a car, including the seat, interior design, and the uh, wire harness, air condition, connector, heat radiator, and other things. So Taiwan is a have very opportunity in this go back car. This is the conclusion I have to say uh, for technology evolution, Taiwan in native the capability for the phone company, uh, phone product, and the noble product, we already build very mature technology. And when the supply chain transformation happens, then Taiwan is quite familiar with this. But of course, uh, Taiwanese have other disadvantages. Maybe we can talk about later in the uh, Q&A session. So in the end, uh, Taiwan, uh, I believe, will create a big value on the electrical vehicle industrial. But I think many Taiwan companies they share technology innovation in Bay Area company, that you company in Bay Area. So I hope in the coming year, we can work together to create the big value for the electrical car industry. Thank you very much to listen to my uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Steve, for your brilliant talk. And I really like you cover all the details about EV and also the opportunities Taiwan is possible to focus on um, including sensors, carpets, um, all the exciting areas. But we do have a question for you. Um, since you talk about like the advantage of Taiwanese companies in EV supply chain, we are also curious that do you think if there are any disadvantage in the EV industry that Taiwanese companies um, have? And specifically, uh, we have a question from Minghua Zhang. Um, the question is, Taiwanese company used to produce ICT products and components in China, but how about now? Do Taiwanese companies still manufacture components for EV in China or now they in elsewhere? Well, I'd love to hear your input on this. Okay, uh, thank you for Kenny. Kenny, thank you for the question. I think uh, my presentation is really optimistic. But the uh, concern say Taiwan is a newcomer for the electrical company. So you talk about technology, the disadvantage of Taiwan company. Uh, this is a very old industrial, more than 100 years. So the disadvantage of Taiwanese should be the language, should be the car maker culture. So this, this is also a difficulty when our sales guy, uh, they uh, since uh, six years ago, we uh, started the, uh, vehicle uh, business. We talk about the uh, Volkswagen, we talk about uh, uh, many company. 
They say, no, no, you, you don't understand me. You, you, you talk about the different language with me. Now, I, I think, I think that, and, and they even say, you don't know the quality level we ask you to do that. So, so this is uh, the pickup trend now we are uh, pretty experienced year by year. So I think we have to keep very humble and uh, we have to learn uh, from the car maker, from the T1 company. Then now, now the good thing is we already get an entrance ticket. We uh, enjoy, we already enjoy the technology evolution, enjoy the supply chain transformation, the two factors. And uh, we step by step, I think we can do things quite well. So awesome. in, you, you talk about the second question is related to the China uh, component company. Can you yeah, repeat it's, again? Um, yeah, definitely. The question is, Taiwanese companies used to produce the ICT products and components in China. And uh, we are curious that, do Taiwanese companies still do so? Do we still manufacture components for EV in China or is now moving to um, anywhere else? Yeah, uh, at this moment, it is. It is. Yeah, we are, uh, I think uh, many town companies that manufacture in China because for the last 20 years, Actually, most of the Taiwanese created uh, and they found the factory in China and uh, bring a lot of the component ecosystem around their factory. But you know, uh, actually, I think now we, we can say the President Trump, they help a lot. They give Taiwanese uh, warning and uh, push Taiwanese to move out of China. And uh, look at today's situation. It's the right decision. We don't, we, we don't really need to rely 100% in China to manufacture everything. So this situation, electrical vehicle is same as the ICT industry, the notebook and the mobile phone. So many companies in Taiwan, they uh, slightly and uh, quickly to move manufacture size in South Asia and including the Vienna, including uh, Malaysia, but the most important is uh, many the important customer is uh, in North America. They want to be local manufacturer to bind in supply chain with them more closely. So actually many, many companies already that invest a lot in the Mexico and they even start to uh, invest a factory uh, manufacturing center inside the United States, including the Michigan, including the Texas. And uh, I also, observe the American government is quite support this idea. They have uh, like uh, USS, and then they have, uh, the main thing is actually the help from US United States government to help Taiwanese company to build a manufacturing site in China, in the, sorry, in North America. So this chain will continue, I think very soon, uh, China and outside China will have a half. And the long term, maybe China will be become smaller if the situation become even uh, like today. I see, I see. Thank you so much for your detailed answer for the question and great question and great answer from Steve. And thank you again for this um, brilliant uh, presentation you brought us today. Okay, thank you everybody to uh, listen to my presentation. Thank you. Talk to you next time. Thank you, bye-bye. Yeah, talk Have to a you nice Friday night. Bye-bye. Bye. And now I will hand over to Mingyan for our last speaker for today. Yeah, let me give a brief, brief introduction to uh, our next speaker, Koli Huang. Koli uh, Huang is a media executive, veteran ICT analyst, analyst, analyst and best-selling author with 35 plus years of experience and close connection with many key persons in the ICT industry and government sector. In 1998, Huang founded DigiTimes, a unique news portal and media platform dedicated to cover all of the global ICT supply chain with a strong focus on Taiwan and China. Please welcome Colin. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gao. Is okay for me? For you? Yeah, it's all your time. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to be invited by you again to present my observation about how uh, Taiwan IC supply chain and semiconductor, or even talk something about the geopolitics. 
And uh, before my presentation, yes, the moderator introduced me is, is a media company's founder and chairman. But actually, Dish Times is a daily newspaper, hot copy one. But hot copy only contributes 2% of our revenue. We provide database services focused on electronic industry, especially. And uh, before my presentation, I think I need to introduce myself a little bit again. I come back to Taiwan in 1985. The year was the taking of year of Taiwan to develop personal computer industry. And the government recruited 20 young men to form a strategy for Taiwan. And uh, I'm one of them. The, the, the organization report to KTV, the Guardian, directly. And uh, I definitely I became the boss in 1990s. The, the, I, I suppose you know the organization called MIC, Market Intelligence Center. I used to be the boss in 1990s. So 1998, I got funded from I got funding from uh, chairman and founder of ASA Group, Mitech Group, TSMC, Macronics, and uh, even uh, Foxconn or other companies. Uh, uh, they invest co-invest these times to provide high tech information daily basis. And I'm the founder and the CEO uh, as long as 25 years. Yes, uh, because you know I provide. Uh, industry information. So governments and the private sectors also uh, come to see me or discuss with me quite often to discuss about possibility not only in Taiwan but also in South Asia countries and uh, and uh, and Asian countries as well. So before COVID nineteen, actually I had the opportunity. I had the opportunity to to present to uh, the ministers. Uh, they they support. They focus on high tech in the countries like Philippines, uh, Thailand, Vietnam, and uh, India as well. So it's my background. So it looks like I'm a media guy, but, but actually more than 30% of my company's revenue derived from consulting services. So it's my background I introduce you at first. So if, uh, in the first page, I would like to emphasize one thing again, the key, key issues be, behind I see this supply chain. People know, know, knowing the new technology like AI or quantum or others, I don't need to emphasize more. But US China trade war now influence us a lot and the emerging markets. And uh, you ask questions uh, to, to lots of speakers, Steve, and you ask questions how and uh, is it possible to uh, Taiwan to maintain their manufacturing uh, uh, activities in China? Uh, just like before, and uh, he said, maybe half of the company will go to to other countries like uh, South Asian countries or, or 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 India even. Yes, I believe so. Especially, uh, electronic electric vehicle vehicle is not an is not a, a industry only focused on uh, manufacturing, but also we need to integrate with the local services. So emerging market is quite important for us, especially. Uh, with the background of the uh, of of the China US trade war, and also we need to think about the decentralized manufacturing. And uh, yes, today more than uh, about eighty percent of the noble PC produced by Taiwanese company. But maybe you didn't know. In, uh, last quarter, I mean third quarter and second quarter of the year, Taiwanese company produced about ninety two percent of the worldwide servers. And most of the first class companies, they, they, I mean, first tier companies, they subcontract to Taiwan. And uh, now they ask Taiwan to produce not only in, in China, but also in Taiwan or other countries. So the companies like uh, Quanta or Pegachong, they may select Vietnam, Thailand, or other countries to, 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 to provide these kind of services as before. So we meet uh, new opportunities and challenges for us. That is a massive market. There's a great challenge for us, but I still believe Taiwan has has very optimistic future in, in the coming decades. So I yes, I was I was invited by Taiwan University, Chaotong, Tsinghua, or other industry people to present them about my observation. But only last month, I I asked my 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 audiences vote for for the four different scenarios. First one is balance. Second one is deadlock between US and China. Third one is isolation. And uh, finally, 
if, if we cannot solve all of the problems, military invention to Taiwan is also possible for. But you know, about only 4.1% believe China US can 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 rebalance again. And uh, most of the people they vote deadlock between US and China will be happen. And this isolation also is, is one of the possibility for us. But in between one and two scenarios, first and second scenarios, stabilized supply chain is our expectation. But you know, most of the people we believe deadlock between isolation, I mean, isolate China manufacturing would be the, 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 the major possibility for us to think about that. So for Taiwan and uh, even Korean companies, Japanese companies have to think about the regional market and the regional market, not only for, for market opportunities, but also for manufacturing and the uh, labor division as well. You know, and uh, media tech, the, the most important IC design house, they subcontract to us for this year's Taiwan's IC design industry yearbook. We, we conduct a survey. Today in Taiwan, we have about 52,000 IC designers. But in, in the coming decades, we need 34,000 more. But it's, it's quite difficult for us. We need to think about how to introduce people from uh, India or, or Vietnam either try to find more engineer work for us. Otherwise, uh, Taiwan, we, we, we are, we're facing the challenges and the bottleneck for industry development. But, you know, if US and the Western camps, we isolate China and the China, we, 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 we got a, a recession and the, 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 there's a big challenge for China in the future. And they, they, they create more, more possibility, a military uh, invention from China to Taiwan. So there is a global crisis. Everybody know that Taiwan will be the anchor for, for global stability. And that's why we need, but in, in this kind of stage, we need to focus on regional market and the manufacturing cooperation. In special level division, we work with the South Asian countries. So Taiwan will be the anchor. And we need to think about how, how Taiwan keep stable and how Taiwan keep efficient and compel uh, and create the opportunities for the uh, global con contribution. So I try to let you know, and uh, based on the, the data from research company, they say all white market demand is about, was about 556 billion US dollars last year. But I believe the, the figures is derived, uh, were derived from two sectors. One is FabLite, another one is IDM FabLite. And uh, this is uh, a total market because only actually in the house and IDM companies they have their products and products to the market. But I believe about 30% of the revenue, I mean, market demand revenue uh, contributed by memory ICs and the 70% contributed by logic micro, micro or analog or, or others. But if it goes to the market, if it goes to the, the, to the end market, and uh, I believe computing devices includes PC and the servers, we contribute about 38% of the worldwide computing, uh, of the worldwide uh, semiconductor consumption. And the 34% goes to communications. And only 9% goes to consumer electronics, 9% goes to automobile and the industry use, like defense or government use, about 10%. There is a market portfolio. But if we goes to want to sell to the market, uh, sell to the semiconductor to the market, I believe, about 35% of the semiconductors goes to component distributors, uh, includes a company like WPG, Wenye, and the Avnet, Aero. Those companies are very active in Asia, especially they focus on mass production. Maybe you didn't know, four, three quarters of the electronic manufacturing services are Taiwanese company. Uh, I suppose that you're familiar with uh, those companies like, uh, like, uh, like Foxconn, Pegatron, uh, we strong or, or event tech or quanta they are the key players in the field but you know only quarter about 25 percent are are contributed by other other countries like uh, countries like philippine thailand vietnam and india they all have one only one uh local ems uh, companies but i believe in the coming decades, they will cooperate with Taiwan to build their, their local manufacturing system. So I personally just believe if Taiwan goes to 
uh, South Asian countries not, not only provide manufacturing services, but also they will co-work with local partners to build a local service system. There is a different things compared to Taiwan, uh, rely on Ta China manufacturing, uh, manufacturing site. And uh, if you want to build the 556 billion new startups, you need uh, EDA2, you need, you, need, you need IP. And you also, then you, the, the product go, goes to Foundry and Aust. There is a portfolio of, of the manufacturing. So manufacturing and the industry value is different from market value. So I try to let you know, we are different. Some of the, some, some people say, uh, TSMC revenue last year was 56%, which means TSMC contribute 10% of the oil market is totally wrong. Uh, TSMC need to, uh, need to identify their revenue into industry value, not, not market value, because TSMC or company like ASE, they, they are manufacturing services company, not, not, they don't have products. So there's different things. And uh, this year, I believe TSMC revenue, we, we expand to 76%, uh, 70, 76 billion US dollars. They, they, they became the number one semiconductor company in the world. They even, their revenue now even bigger than T, uh, Intel and, and Samsung in semiconductor field. I just try to let you know, there is a different uh, approach to know the portfolio and uh, uh, the, the, the possibility that, that you know, and how is Taiwan position and how is uh, American position in, in the market. If we count everything together, as I mentioned, in the year 2021, a total industry revenue as big as 894 billion US dollars. When American companies contribute about 40%, and Taiwan contribute about 70.3%, uh, and Korea has about 15%. And uh, China, just like uh, ex CEO of SMIC, say, say that is about 5% of the worldwide. And I believe they, 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 are, they have about 7%. And the European companies, Japanese companies also contribute about 10% of the worldwide industry value. There is a different from market value. I just tried to explain to you. There is a different approach to know the portfolio. And I emphasize again, uh, America is still the strongest and most competitive industry player in this field, in semiconductor. They contribute about 40% of the worldwide industry value. And Taiwan is second largest one, 17%. Uh, Korea is, is third one. 15% about there is a uh, uh, position and uh, I try to let you know. And if we goes to the market, most of the branding companies still are American companies like uh, Intel, like, uh, like AMD, Nvidia, Broadcom, Qualcomm, they are American based company. They, they have about half of the world market. And who is the second largest one? Of, of course, not, not Taiwan. Korea is second largest one because Samsung and Hynix, they may have about 57% of the worldwide memory IC market, and they have about 3% uh, less uh, system LSI market in the world. So that's what I want to explain to you. They are the number two. If you, if you, only, if you only count the branding and the, and the market value, they are the number two in the world. Taiwan is number three. And who is number four? Maybe Europe and Japan, and uh, China is, has about 6.1% worldwide. There is a portfolio different from traditional way to think about the, this industry. I try, I just try to let you know it's it's a, it's a observation from Taiwan, and uh, people like to know why TSMC is so su successful. I believe there is something to do with the MT Intel or, or Nvidia fight with Intel because you know they leverage TSMC foundry, and uh, people know those kind of things a lot. I don't need to emphasize more, but I I would like to emphasize one thing more, uh, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Tesla, they're trying to develop their own chips. They, they will be the new ecosystem and the worldwide market trend in the future. And the, absolutely Alibaba tension, they try to get these kind of activities, but now because chip X or others, it's more difficult than before. And uh, only two weeks ago, I was invited by T TSIA, Taiwan Semiconductor Industry Association as a keynote, as a speaker to uh, in the annual meeting. And uh, I, I just talk, talk something about TSMC, uh, uh, front, uh, front of uh, TSMC chairman, Mark Liu. And I just say, uh, TSMC has a real competitiveness about the 
the, the framework advantage, uh, I, I would like to emphasize three pillars. One is bioprocess technology, second one is crime structure, and third one would be ecosystem. And it, it's, it's very difficult for companies to get three one together, but TSMC really does. And I know they have the best the process technology. I don't need to talk too much, but in case of the crime structure, as I know, as I know, TSMC has more than 500 uh, core customers and uh, Samsung only has about 110. That, that's why I know about that. Maybe you didn't know, I speak Korean well. I used to be the exchange students between Taiwan and Korea in 1980s. So I, I stayed there two years. I studied Korean industry for, for, for almost 40 years. So I know something about that kind of thing. So it's not e easy for the Korean companies to, to catch up, especially uh, behind the ecosystem, the, the, the bad ecosystem in the world. You know, TSMC invests about 47% of their total revenue into the CapEx in, in year 2020, and maybe something like uh, uh, 40, another 47% in year 2023. So if Samsung revenue from foundry only one third of, of TSMC, they need to invest 150%, otherwise it's impossible to catch up. So there's a framework, there's a competitiveness uh, for long term. Last year, Taiwan export about 155 billion to, to other countries. But 60% of Taiwan export semiconductor will go to China. But maybe you, did, you guys didn't know, uh, global trading business, they, 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 they have 26% goes to uh, go, go by L. And by Taiwan is 47, 47%. It's, it's about Taiwan exports semiconductor a lot. It's similar to, to Korea, the same, same issue. But you know, you may didn't know, China also exports 158, uh, 100, sorry, uh, 154 billion starts about uh, exports. But I believe there are many semiconductors actually derived from Taiwan, not China produced by themselves and export. Because companies like Xiaomi, Lianxiang, now they have a manufacturing site in other countries, but most of the semiconductor and uh, even composite level, they rely on Taiwanese manufacturing system. So there's a reason why Taiwan, uh, China also export a lot to other countries. And uh, today, I seven, seven years ago, I wrote a book about uh, First Island Chain. And half half century before, we believe we believe Japan, Korea, Taiwan are in are in the front line because you know capitalist and uh, and the uh, capital capital leader. But today we are still in the in the in the front line. That's why that's why I say we are in the Asian age. But today is high high tech island chain because semiconductors. But people ask me a lot of things if. Countries like India or Vietnam, they, they really need a, a FAFs or something like that. But if, if you, you know, in year 2030, India will become the number three GDP country in the world. They even be, will be bigger than Japan. It's, it's about population, absolutely. But you know, if the country as big as Japan today, they, they, will, they, they, will, they will expect uh, the industry like semiconductor or LC panel in the future. So I I, I have received a, 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 a invitation to go India recently. So we will try to to know each other and how to cooperate in the future. And uh, if you know, seven months ago, Chairman of Foscom he visited India and uh, uh, and uh, and had a meeting with uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi of India, and then he he goes to. Indonesia also met the president, uh, government presidents in Indonesia. So Taiwan is now is very welcomed by, by South Asian countries. It's, uh, absolutely, we, we got big challenges, but I still believe, you know, no other countries can build the manufacturing system like Taiwan today we have. So it's quite difficult. Maybe you didn't know, only last year, in Taiwan, we have 800 listed electronic companies. 
if we only count those companies' revenue, the revenue as big as 940 billion US dollars. And we believe this year will be bigger than one trillion. And uh, Taiwan has a very good financial system and a very good uh, talents. And I just heard from a uh, chairman of our partnerships yesterday. And he said, in Taiwan's uh, foundry companies or semiconductor manufacturers in the house, most of the engineers, they have double a master degree or, or, or even better. So it, it's not similar to other countries. We focus and we, we emphasize, we help semiconductors what we can do. And we, we try with our best. So Taiwan is different from other countries. If you go to other countries, it's, it will not the same environment and the conditions to compete with in the global market. So Dutch Times also conducted a lot of survey about supply chain in Asia. It is also, yes, that is true. It's similar, it's relative with my personal uh, personal experience. I used to be the advisor for Indian and Thailand government in 1990s because Taiwan successful experience before. So I, I believe many of you maybe was born in Taiwan or, or study in Taiwan before. And uh, you know, our age, our generation, we, we, we have many people that have engineering background and uh, we, we focus on personal computer, then we build our local semiconductor industry. So we have the best uh, ecosystem and the most of the electronic companies that they located in Xinzhou and Taipei area. There is one now distance that are density even bigger than California, even better than California in this kind of manufacturing system. So today, Yes, we're trying to identify not only ICT, but also we include, uh, we count the automobile uh, and, uh, and the machinery industry together. If we count those companies together in, in Asia top 100, 34 companies uh, come from Japan, 37 from China, 11 from South Korea, and Taiwan has 14 uh, as well. So we are not small. And, uh, but I always say that Taiwan is a harmless partner. If even we co work with any other country, we don't have this kind of challenge. We don't have this kind of challenge. People say, people knew that. Co work with Taiwan is very safe, it's very secure. So even Japan tried to, Sony trying to convince TSMC or other, Taiwan, other companies to go to Japan to work for their project. Even Japan today, they don't have advanced 12 inch paper line. So Taiwan is the best choice for that. And uh, also, we have very good. Uh, financial results over the past decade. I don't need to emphasize more. And I just try to let you know, you know, based on the CP insights, I, 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 I try to uh, survey uh, unicorns worldwide basis. And uh, over 10 years, most of the unicorns, I mean, maybe more than half are American based company. China always contributed 20 to 25%, but after uh, year 2020, after COVID-19, or, or after US-China trade war, China's contribution reduced to 15%. But who are the next one? India. Today, India has 68 companies that are the unicorns. So I believe they need solutions. I mean, hardware solutions, industrial PC solutions. Uh, so we, we are the choices. And uh, maybe, you, you have to believe. And the Samsung also purchased a lot, a lot of products from Taiwan. So Taiwan's still very promising in this kind of things. Today, we need to think about, and we need to help other countries to build a similar system because it's impossible for Taiwan to, to, to produce more PCs, to be, produce more monitors in Taiwan locally. So I, I just try to let you know, we need to uh, help countries like the Philippines, Vietnam, or other countries together to, to link all of the second tier posts work together. So yes, I one day I discussed with the founder of Foscom. He told me that one word, two systems, I believe so. But who will be the key? I believe Taiwan will be the key. Not only South Asian countries, but also Canada, Mexico. If you, American want to, most of the Latin, pe Latin American people uh, stay in Latin America to help Taiwan to build manufacturing site in those countries would be the best choice for. So that's what I actually I, I, I try to identify some possibilities like we built 
uh, data center cloud services system to, to co-work with countries like India, Vietnam, or, or Philippines to build uh, smart cities. There is also possible for Taiwan to think about that. And we need a new southbound project uh, because there's a mega trends and we need local touch, not only manufacturers. So I just try to let you know, local brands co-work with local companies like telco, telco companies, and co funds ICT spice in other countries to, to build a uh, Shinto science code model in other countries, not only to expand in Taiwan. And then we need a local unit to leverage local unicorns. And the future cars, electric car, will be the choice for us in the future. So India, Taiwan, and the Asian countries will be the uh, will be the very important uh, the new, new formula for us to work together in the future. So the last sentence I want to share with you, you must unlearn what you have learned. We are totally different. We are facing a new challenges, uh, not like before. So it's my presentation, but because time is limited, I try with my best to explain to you. Thank you, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Koli. Very, very informative talk. And we have one question for you. Uh, yes. The question is, with the CHIP Act continuing evolving from the US government against China, what do you observe as the opportunities for other countries? Do you observe clear migration of any specific industry segments? Yeah, that's a question. As you know, if you want to build a 12 inch urban line today, at least seven to eight billion US dollars. Even Taiwan focus on semiconductor, even Taiwan uh, enjoy 12 to 15% of our GDP uh, contribution from semiconductor industry, but it's, it doesn't work in Taiwan any uh, like traditional model. I believe we, we only need to keep about 80%, not 99% like today. We need to share with others. And, uh, but I just want to convince the countries like India, don't try 10 nanometer. You, you should try 90, 90 nanometer or, or 45 nanometer, they will be better. Just like uh, if they want to co-work with Taiwan, not ask AUO in the in rocks to go India. Maybe you can buy CPT, Zhonghua Yingguan. They, they will be better choice because most of the Indian family is, they, 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 they don't need the screen size bigger than 42 inch. So there is a better way. Uh, countries like India, they, they, they have to uh, more reasonable to think about the possibility. I had been to India for them more than 20 times. I met their secretary and their ministers. They always want the most advanced, advanced technology, but it doesn't work. The, their advantage is, is local market opportunity, but maybe you didn't know, India uh, automobile market is number five in the world. They have about 4 million uh, vehicles every year and the two, 20 million two wheels motorcycles in the market. They are the number one in the, in the world. So leverage their own strengths, just like Taiwan. We, we are smaller, but our density is higher and they have better uh, talents for engineering. They, they are our, our strengths. So we succeed. So that's what I suggest to other countries. And uh, also just for Taiwan, we cannot keep everything in Taiwan just like before. It's impossible. Okay. Yeah, thank you very thank you very much for your answer. And we have another another question for you from uh, Minghua Zhang. Um, the question is: Will India replace China as Taiwan's next most fiber investment destination for manufacturing semiconductor chips? What will be the likely new supply chain network given the growing U.S. China confrontation? Okay, because I'm not American, I'm not a Chinese people living in China. So the only one thing I need to think is how to create space for Taiwan. And then not to rely on America, not to rely on China. We create opportunities and then the people need us. We need to co-work, as I mentioned, that's why I emphasize again and again, to help Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, Thailand, India, to build their own system. They, we can create more opportunities, not rely on American market and rely on Chinese market. Then we can, uh, there's a prosperity for global economy, not only for Taiwan, but Taiwan has the most, the best experience in this field. As I mentioned, three quarters of the EMS manufacturing services are derived from Taiwanese contribution. 
No other countries have this kind of system, even Korea. No, they don't have. So the best way is to convince Taiwan to go Vietnam, to go uh, Philippines, and uh, to build, they create component demand. That's one thing. Secondly, to connect with local services. Today, in the ICT industry is not a manufacturing industry. It also needs button up application approach to work with local companies. Like uh, India, they, they may have four uh, successful te telco companies. They even have the channel in Eastern Africa. So if you, if you want to go Kenya, if you want to go Egypt, you need to work with them. So there is a possibility for us to think about that. Or even you, when you work with South Asian countries, you may didn't know 80% of the Malaysian population are Indian uh, heritage. So, and most of the uh, Indian people, they, their, their, their mother, mother, mother country were Tamil Nadu. Do you know Tamil Nadu? Tamil people. Tamil people are 15% of the Indian population. So if you work with them, they, they speak same languages, same cultures, just like, you know, we have many people living in uh, South Asian countries that are Hakka people. So it's similar to, so we need to work with them to help them to build their own manufacturing system. Taiwan, as I mentioned, we are so lucky. We, we just, just like uh, get a lottery. And then we have the semiconductor industry like today. But don't expect the same way. And uh, that's why I say we need money, we need talents, we need the lands, we need to, uh, we need local market opportunities, we need electric electric vehicle. Believe me, because ev electric vehicle is more easier to produce. So countries like Vietnam, Thailand, easy for them. So fast come doing today. They, they, they share their manufacturing capability and work with those countries and to build MIH platform. That's a very smart way. And finally, I would like to emphasize, I would like to recommend one type of the business. There is a component distributors. Com companies like uh, WPG, like Wenye, like Eminent, they are so, so important, but people didn't know them. You, you may didn't know WPG revenue Last year was 28 billion US dollars. They are not a small company. One year has 16%, another 16%. They are so, so competitive, so important. They built their manufacturing, their warehousing and services system to the manufacturers. So without them, the industry cannot succeed. So countries like India, Thailand, Malaysia need to know they can now mechanism, not only as TSMC to go, so that's what I suggest to them. Thank you. Thank you very much for your answer. We have another great question for you. It's a long question. The question is, as Taiwan faces talent shortage in the semiconductor and electronic industry in the future, can you give some suggestion how Taiwan can transform its workforce in the future with a stabilized population that is no longer growing? How can Taiwan stay on the cutting edge of technology innovation? Are there certain sectors Taiwan should focus in the technology industry? For example, quantum computing, block, blockchain, electric vehicle. Firstly, our generation, but I mean our generation uh, entrepreneurs need to go, go back to campus to teach young men. So I commit at least 50 hours this this year to the University of Taiwan University, Tsinghua and Jiaoda to share of my experience in the field. They, they didn't know how important of Taiwan's electronic industry. And uh, you know, we have many new investors. I don't need to emphasize more, but always I, I what I can say, Taiwan is harmless partner because we want to help others. I even uh, suggest government need to organize a delegation with uh, gen our generation, our experienced people to help the countries, Asian countries or, or India to build a local system. If they work with Taiwan and we can build this kind of system as soon as possible. Not, we, we don't need to always watch the US-China trade war because you know we don't have the decision-making power to say something. But you, you may, may ask me questions about quantum, AI or, or, or even metaverse. Yes, 
we expect those kind of opportunities. But believe me, we don't have the power to make decision. We are not the the, the methodology, or we, are, we we don't have the 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 secretary uh, uh, secret uh, formula to 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 build the industry. But Taiwan has the best response responsible capability to help people to uh, commercialize. To 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 so, I I I had uh, stayed in California for 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 about one year. I know California now. I'm not a guide stranger for California. But you know, most of the California uh, Taiwanese people, when they come back to Taiwan, they always ask Taiwan to learn California. No, Taiwan is different way. Different way. It's impossible for entrepreneur uh, doing the same way like California. We don't have the unicorns. Don't ask us to become a unicorn. So it, it's, we, we need a mini unicorn. 100 million US dollars is good enough for us. So take different way to think about different country, different states. So that's what I suggest to you. And uh, I'm going to America. I'm going to California next week. I will talk to some of the, my not here friends. Maybe have dinner or something like that. Thank yeah, you welcome, for your invitation welcome. anyway. Yeah. <laughs> welcome, welcome. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Coley, for your very informative, fantastic presentation and very detailed answering. And, and thank you again. And let's go back to our slides. Okay, so uh, this is our first day event, and we would like to promote our second day event of our UTHF day two event. The topic will be uh, Web 3.0, Blockchain, cryptograph Cryptography, and Bitcoin, BTC. And the, the, keynote, speaker, the keynote speaker will be Alan. Uh, he is a co-founder and CEO of Chain Reaction. And we also have two invited speaker, Claire Chow. Uh, she is a founding officer and director of Filecoin Foundation and Tom, Troy Cross, the fellow of Bitcoin Policy Institution. And you could also scan the QR code on the left hand side. They will uh, lead you to the, uh, the, the website about this event. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so for the day two, we also have the industry panel. The topic is the same web 3.0 blockchain crypto. And the topic is what does blockchain mean for nation? And we have our uh, moderator, James Lee, uh, senior advisor from Tytra and Alex Liu, CEO from Mancoin. And also Troy Cross, the fellow from Bitcoin Policy Institution. Yeah, so yeah, that's it. Yeah, I hope everyone find it this forum like really inspiring and learn a lot as me personally did. Um, so shout out to people that make this forum possible, make this happen, our community team, and thanks to Jimin, Joseph, Rex, and especially thanks to Digital Times VP, Ethan Su, and also the Director of Taipei Economy and Cultural Office at San Francisco, the Director uh, Chen Ling Sheng for the great support. Also, we want to call out um, many acknowledgement for everyone helping, volunteering for this event to make this forum happen. I uh, want to shout out Alice, Aries, Jennifer, Peggy, Grace, Bruce, James, Ken, Mark, Mingyan, and definitely each one of you uh, so engaged in this event and asking so many great questions to the speakers. Um, and again, just want to say, we will also try to pass the question to speakers for the question that we didn't have chance to get over through. Um, so please join our Facebook group or subscribe our newspaper for getting this answer from our awesome speakers. And we really appreciate your participant. And in fact, that we are so appreciate that uh, you joined, that we actually have a gift for you. So if you can uh, take some time, answer six questions from our post-event survey, um, then we'll have uh, pick some lucky winner. We have several giveaway, all the books we have. And 
no matter where your location is, um, we will mail the book to your place. So please uh, take one minute to scan the QR code that we have in this slide and just uh, answer this very brief survey. Okay, I just like give everyone maybe five more minutes. And awesome, yeah. Then that's our last slide for today. Um, several things, just to some reminder, please register for our day two event happen next week. Um, it's also a free event. So I hope to see you see you all there as well for our day two event that Minyan uh, just introduced. And thank you all speakers, um, awesome speakers that we have for today to give um, us like so inspirational content to answer questions. Thank you for uh, all the people attending this event. And lastly, um, if you're in the States, happy Friday. And if you're in Taiwan, I hope you have, we hope you have a great weekend. Thank you.